This video contains full spoilers for Ratchet and Clank, uh, the whole series actually, including Rift Apart. So if you've not had a chance to play it yet, I would advise that you stay away from this video uh, if you're at all interested, because there's a lot of mysteries that are worth uncovering firsthand for yourself. Otherwise, enjoy the video. <laughs> Eureka! She's done it! Ratchet, can you hear me? Ratchet, can you hear me? Clank, are you okay? Where are you? I saw that Lombax take you in- I am fine. In fact, I am with the Lombax now. Hey, I'm Rivet. What? Hi! Wow, this is... Oh, wait, okay. I, I have to tell you something. Dr. Nefarious just crowned himself emperor of this dimension. He did what? No, 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 no! I've got my hands full with my own Nefarious! That's the thing. We've got to get him and us out of here. But without the Dimensionator... I think we have to build a new one. I met a prophet from Savali named Gary. He would know what to do. I'm only a few sectors away from there. I can go check it out. What can we do? Do you have the planet Blizzard Prime in this dimension? Yeah. Why? We can locate the phase quartz used to power the Dimensionator there. If I am right, we will be able to recreate the device in no time. I guess we better get started then. I'm glad you're okay, buddy. You too, Ratchet. Be, Be careful, careful out, out there. there. Wow. Another, Another Lombax. As time goes on, I'm certain that I'll forget about how long it was or what sort of a task this game was facing down from even just a logistical point of view. What a confused nightmare. Trying to follow up on a series after this amount of time when its last four entries had each affected the canon or style of the series drastically and apparently without much commitment to a longer plan. I don't know what's going on behind the scenes, but I think it got pretty messy to say the least. And it must have been difficult to know what to pick up and what to leave behind for this new sequel. But now that Insomniac are in what looks like a safer economic position as one of Sony's official first party developers, it looks like both the creative and financial restrictions which painted them into a corner that developed the last four Ratchet and Clanks in the first place is a position that they're not in anymore. And without time or money to doubt nearly as centrally, it looks like Rift Apart was poised to take advantage of the creativity, care and power that this new studio is just bursting at the seams with. With two new directors, making this the first mainline entry Ratchet game by Insomniac, not led by Brian Allgaier, Marcus Smith and Mike Daly represent a wave of new blood that's flooded into the Insomniac offices in the years since A Crack in Time. As with many AAA games, the writing team on this game was huge, but I believe that it was led by Lauren Mee and Sam Max, the role of which TJ Fixman had filled during the PlayStation 3 era. These are all really big shoes to step into, and I've found myself considering Rift Apart as having been kind of developed by a different studio the same way I would approach a new studio developing for an established franchise, I mean. It's still Insomniac, but there have been enough major changes in and around Insomniac for this game to feel, to me, like it's made by different authors with different priorities. Still, in the lead up to its release, none of me knew what to expect from Rift Apart, and I kept myself very hidden from the details to kind of enhance what I what surprises I knew it would give me, but also so that I wouldn't judge it too harshly just based on what it was, because I my expectations are pretty high if this is a true sequel. But it is, and it's coming at this franchise with one very obvious need. If it's a sequel, I think it needs to jumpstart the series again and get it back canonically to where its potential pointed at the end of its last full-length release. It needs to just focus right back to where it was. What Rift has done from a narrative point of view, I think is take a few steps backward, picked up some new gear, 
and yeah, retread some old ground, but it's done so so that it can get a running start again. Allowing the series time to breathe and basically skip an entire console before coming back to its roots might not be exactly what happened on paper, but in the interest of cutting it some slack, I just want to set in stone somewhere right away, no matter where it sits in the canon. Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart is the sequel to a crack in time that 12 years told me I would never get to play. That's big for me. Rift Apart is perfectly emblematic of the incredible and vastly underestimated series that Ratchet & Clank became during the PS3 generation, and it makes that happen through multiple avenues, manages to execute and improve on many of the series' core ideals in styles and with scope that fit so naturally without ever feeling unrecognizable, and in so doing, Rift becomes something of a platonic ideal of a Ratchet & Clank video game. It's a melting pot that pays tribute to so much of the series prior and combines it all so smoothly that I think that anybody who's enjoyed any other Ratchet & Clank game will find something to enjoy here. And of course, that means new players will fall in love with this entry as easily as someone would get to know the whole of the rest of the franchise. And it has brought me and a version of myself who was 12 years younger an unspeakable amount of joy to just to play this game. Truly, I never thought that this would happen. In some ways, I think Crack is still the most unique entry to the series. Rift definitely shares more on paper with the combat focus of number three or Tools of Destruction. And today, I want to talk about what I see it's improved and finessed on in that way, and what of its own that it's brought forward alongside. This is just a full critique of Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart for the PS5. Let's do it. This is extremely unnecessary. Before I say anything less important, Rift Apart is an exceptionally detailed game in so many ways, but it's also a really compact one. It feels like it's built exclusively for the niche of people who are like, oh, I just want an experience, I don't want a game that's too long, I just want the game to be done. In, in fact, I think the game is so gorgeous, visually, so much of the time, that for me to try to describe the thousands of words that these pictures tell with my own far less adequate phrases, would be a degrading refraction of their mastery. What I'll just say instead is that this game looks pretty much perfect and is home to so much detail that even trying to appreciate it all would require me to learn, I think, a lot more about the specifics of animation than I currently have the language for. It's not without one or two problems in a presentation sense. There's some occasional visual glitches and cutscenes on translucent materials. The Resistance Turncoat character, the Warden of Zordoom, I think is persistently unclear despite being the second character introduced in the game. I don't think a minimap option would have gone astray, particularly in the game's early sections, but there's something so freeing in being able to just surrender to a superior command of visuals and just let the game do what it does. That's always what I'm asking for, to never be drawn out, to always be engaged and effectively told the story at hand. And by now, Insomniac's approach to Ratchet & Clank storytelling is so well refined that to notice the repeated trends and surrender to them anyway is the best possible benefit of their expertise and experience. Visually, this game never does draw me out, and it's, it's, it's incredible to not have to worry about it. But there's finally shit like environmentally appropriate wear and tear on bolt crates. What I want to know is how the hell does software approximate temperature like this game manages to convey? What the hell kind of wizardry is heat rising from a lava bed to warp the entire screen like steam is rising from the surrounding pits so that even your character is warping on the screen but keep it subtle enough to not just look like a filter's been slapped on there. I don't know whether I'm impressed or confused at how light affects the air in this game. I just don't 
quite understand not only how software is able to do this, but how do you sit down at a table and think to put that in the game in the first place? Look at the air and think, yeah, there's more we can do here. How do you know what makes this look impressive? What pushes it over the edge? Like, I'm not a visual artist in this way. Like, I edit video, I have my own visual thoughts, but none of these occur to me. The characters feel so in tune with a particular mood of an environment, and every visual touch enhances that experience. Riven on Sargasso feels like she belongs there, melds into the world, but playing as Ratchet in Nefarious City makes him feel like a bit of an outsider, a little cold and alone. Praising the visuals is one thing, but the mood that all of this promotes and how it feels to stand in each environment as that particular character is entirely another. And it's the kind of magic that I forever long to feel from virtual worlds like these. The vocal performances are off the chain and give such a sense of individuality to each major character that embodying them, portrayed both physically and audibly and emotionally with such likability inside environments which flawlessly promote it is smoother than silk. Stepping into the shoes of these characters is so easy to do. The brevity of the load times is the first time in a while that a game has made me feel old. I remember the days when we used to have to watch three different flying animations covering the load screen. Now it seems the technology is so capable of moves like this that the game has to slow itself down instead. My old habits of placing the controller on my leg when I anticipate there's a moment for me to like take a drink or something and now like, oh, we're already there, oh shit. It seems like the whole of Rift Apart's central premise has been devised to exploit this particular new lightning fast SSD to show off this exact technical feature. The opening stage's dimensional shifting between planets and areas, which at every other moment will take space flight to reach, is overwhelming and it's supposed to be. The spectacle afforded to this game by the PS5's power and the talent driving it is on a scale and speed and inscrutability I've truly never seen before, and there isn't a property I can think of which is better suited to show it off. Ratchet's been a visually focused series since the days of Tools, but there's something about the amount of polish that Rift has which makes the tech showcase element of the game and spectacle far less obvious than it used to be. How many pretty lights can I throw at the screen at one time hits a little different when it's actually in combination with a story hook that I care about. Technical power isn't usually enough to fuel an experience on its own, and Insomniac seem very aware of that too, usually knowing when to dial things down for quieter character moments which are just as beautiful and polished but just in a less in-your-face way than a giant explosive boss section. There's artistic dynamic to that. Again, such quick hardware means that, more than ever, the game's limitations and moments to stop are set by itself. The cutscene presentation is beautifully evolved from the stylings of the whole franchise, incorporating the occasional old flair with like crayon drawings and joke segments. There's still the old tricks, cutting to villain asides to remind players who they're fighting and what they're up against to keep the adversity up while the majority of the missions unfold. But it seems like the best of the best scenes from Crack, that ultra high quality they presented, is now something of the norm without needing to be pre-rendered. Have I mentioned before how much I love cutscenes that aren't pre-rendered? I bloody love them. So good. Preserves cosmetics. Represents the game consistently. So good. Love that this is the norm now. I love it. This is the part where you lose. Ratchet, the Dimensionator. The music is, overall, a really great blend of exciting brass-centric orchestral themes, with a few beautiful moments of piano or strong, subtle synth work in there. But it also mixes in those old school electronic beeps and boops like you'd hear in The Great Clock or earlier games, as if it's referencing the style of the series beforehand flawlessly. Composed by Mark Mothersbaugh, another first timer to the series, he's created a great blend of grand and nostalgic, even if it occasionally steers too close with its main theme to an iconic signature of a certain Pixar superhero family. The fidelity on Ratchet took some getting used to, I'll say. The extra detail on his facial fur is sometimes a little more real than I've had to consider before, and he's got more of a mouth and teeth than a snout than he sometimes had. At first it's a little odd to see so perfectly his 
upper lip and his lower lip, otherwise known as just his lips. So, the premise of Rift Apart follows Ratchet and his visible lips as he and Clank initially attend a celebration of them and their achievements, basically just to catch players up on their journey loosely so far, and for the game to be clear and open that it knows how long it's been since its last storytelling installment. Nonetheless, the parade ends with the reveal that Clank has repaired the Dimensionator, so that Ratchet can finally go looking for the Lombaxes after all this time. And in a way, thank Ratchet for all that he sacrificed for Clank's sake. Before Ratchet can explain his own fears about that though, Dr. Nefarious appears and attempts to steal the Dimensionator for himself. After a spectacular chase sequence introducing dimensional effects and fighting the rebranded Goons for Less gang hired by Nefarious, the good Doctor transports himself, Ratchet and Clank into an alternate dimension where he's always been the victor of the myriad fights he's had with the duo over the years. However, this means that the alternate dimension contains a different history and counterpart creatures to Ratchet, Nefarious, and Clank, all existing within their own circumstances. Circumstances the explosion of the Dimensionator aggravates even further. Ratchet and Clank begin a mission to build a new Dimensionator so that they can take themselves and Nefarious back to their original home, but it quickly becomes a mission to foil the plans of this dimension's Nefarious from escalating the dimensional conflict and putting the entire multiverse in jeopardy. To do this, Clank and Ratchet team up with Rivet, another Lombax who is quite possibly Ratchet's dimensional counterpart, who's been fighting this dimension's Nefarious, the Emperor of this galaxy, for basically her whole life. I won't give a point by point on the whole narrative from here on out. Again, you can play the game for that, but suffice it to say that this journey to rebuild the Dimensionator and eventually stop Emperor Nefarious from using it takes Ratchet, Clank, Rivet, and Clank's counterpart, Kit, on a journey across 10 different worlds, if you count the initial chase sequence. Somehow, that either doesn't seem quite enough, or maybe it's just a classic case of this gameplay formula being so addictive and infectious that I can't help but want more and more of it all the time. So, let's start by talking about how cool it is to shoot stuff in, in it. Give me the part. Did you follow me here? Another fruitless effort to win my affection? Give me the part, Pierre. Time and again, I tell you, my heart is taken. And yet... Rusty Pete? Rusty? Mon dieu, your friend has a saucy tongue. My name is Pierre Lafayre. Pirate Extraordinaire. I'll fight you for it. Xerthes <laughs> is a violent spree, so take it outside. I am more lover than fighter. And for you, I will always make an exception. Ready to kick some robo-butt? I have many issues with that question, but why not? So despite the obviously insane visual touches and movement, which I'll be getting to later on, Rift's combat functions on the surface pretty similarly to what we've come to expect from the series with a few refinements. So the Lombaxes share an arsenal and a bolt stash. This is a streamlining choice, I think at the cost of suspension of disbelief. Often it would feel a little weird to suddenly hold a weapon or use an item that I had acquired as the other character, because in my head they still wouldn't have it, but I became used to it after a time and totally prefer it to the alternative. I do think it's a little strange how there's still bolt crates inside Clank's dimensional envisionments, however, come on now. There's a few combat touches here that feel really subtle and incredibly smooth, to the point where I didn't even notice them unless I was looking for them. First is the relationship between Strafe and Lock Strafe that this game presents. It's the two movement modes which have fought for default position in various titles over the series history. Are you locked in or can you move freely? Typically, Lock Strafe combat was presented for the games which had combat as more of a focus than platforming. The default movement here in Rift Apart is non-locked, but marries the Strafe button to the Aim button or if the game detects that you're in the presence of enemies with a weapon equipped. I've always had to, in a prior game, hold down a button to lock myself into strafing during combat, but that button in this game belongs to the accuracy or aim mode. So to begin with, I thought I'd always have to be in aim mode while firing. It's not the case. The game makes the call to put you in strafing or not, based on whether or not it recognizes you as being in combat with a foe at any time, 
and if you're holding anything except the wrench or hammer, you're locked. It's super intelligent, super subtle, and very easy to get used to. The accuracy mode is also really quite cool, bringing it down low over the shoulder of the character, feeling more like a TPS than ever, but preserves the character's movement while it's down here. It does come in handy often for more precise weapons, it clicks through the different shoulder with a depress of the right stick, and just like the regular combat stays absolutely rock solid following your crosshair. It seems strange, but the game knows that if you're shooting at something, you're not looking at your character, you're looking at where your bullets are going, so it's not shy about letting Riven or Ratchet actually jump higher than the camera can see, so that your combat viewpoint always stays low to the ground, consistent and direct. In combination with this, the majority of enemies that you'll face in Rift Apart are either flying or much, much bigger than your character. The nefarious forces are huge and imposing, and the flight of many other enemies means that your expanded movement options won't completely bewilder them for long. They can keep up with you, so the whole game promotes much more ranged combat than up close. Getting swarmed by these huge foes with their evil looking flail arms and jealous face shields is daunting and occasionally quite frightening. I particularly appreciated how their colour schemes evolved slowly over the course of the game, becoming more and more gruesome looking foes as the story progressed. Adding to this, I played Rift Apart on the highest difficulty for my first playthrough. There are five settings, the lowest of which means that your characters can never die, the highest of which becomes the first time that I've been genuinely challenged by a Ratchet game consistently across the experience in many years, particularly early on with fewer weapons available and lower total health, learning and planning out the combat encounters using cover, knowing the environments, where nanotech was, as well as keeping on control of my movement was essential to getting through these fights, and I enjoyed these obstacles immensely. The enemy types all combined with each other to force a level of play from me that I don't think I've had to reach for Ratchet since I was young. With more movement tools at its disposal, which again I'll be getting to, the game is aware that the skill ceiling is higher as well, and plays to that appropriately. The game also adds in something of a stealth element on occasion, with the ability for foes to lose Ratchet in fog, or to sneak right by certain foes if you're being careful. I'd love to see this expanded on in future games, particularly if platforming was combined with stealth. I digress, the way nefarious troops in particular complement each other is really great enemy design and I really enjoyed fighting everything about them. Their passive aggressive authoritative barks as well, the John Mulaney twang, which initially seems funny, like allow me to escort you to your new prison cell, actually became more and more frightening as the game went on until it became really quite intimidating to hear my demise approached with such loud, fervent glee. The Rebel Lombax! She cannot leave! Try and stop me! It's the kind of voice acting and direction choice that I'd consider quite unique for enemy combatants, and the effect was really, really strong. The troops will speak and confer with each other, sometimes talk to you, and name you as well. My favourite, of course, being the interior decorators have returned. Impossible! Those decorators did not just disappear. Guard the power source! I have found the decorators! We shall decorate the floor with them! It's that classic ratchet humour that feels smoother here than ever. Other enemies have their own unique dialogue as well, warning their mates of which weapon you're using with character appropriate expressions. The pirates speak like pirates, sometimes in rhyming scheme, and finally feel like an aggressive, driven people to fight against. They're sort of used more sparingly to break up the enemy types and left until later in the game as well, so they can be quite tough and pose a real threat in a fight. A particular highlight goes to the pirate mini-boss, a threatening redesign of their tools iteration with some epiphanic sound design choices, using the foley of creaking, stretching ropes on ships before they fire a large blast. What a brainwave. I do think there are probably a few too many mini boss fights across the game, however, often recycling the same larger enemies. This became more of a problem as soon as I realized that the mini boss themselves were sometimes the only enemy I needed to beat to just end the combat, which feels artificial. Let's talk about the weapons though. The weapons in this game are, for the most part, completely brand new, with only a handful coming over from previous titles. 
The weapons in Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart include the Burst Pistol, the most adequately named weapon of the series, but surprisingly feels really fun to use. It kind of reminds me of a Splatoon weapon in the way that it leaves behind stains on enemy hulls. The Shatter Bomb is a bomb glove for a discerning user, there's a throw arc. The Ricochet fires a ball bearing at an enemy, which then bounces off of them a number of times at your command rebounding off their head and is good for interruptions and stun locking. There is a trade-off to using such a useful weapon though. Since it forces you to focus on one foe at the cost of firing again at a different enemy, it takes extra attention to keep the rebounds going and draws more of your attention to hit the trigger button again and again. So it's a high risk, high reward gun to use. The Negatron Collider charges up a large beam that you can use to sweep across the battlefield or focus on one enemy. The Enforcer is a double barreled shotgun, a really powerful one. Mr. Fun Guy is this game's less intrusive version of Mr. Zircon. The Topiary Sprinkler is a good one. It's like a mini turret, but instead of firing bullets, it turns enemies into <sighs> a shrubbery. A shrubbery! The Lightning Rod. Some genius at Insomniac thought that it would be a great idea to take the buzz blades, the magnet launcher, and the plasma coil and put them in the same gun. I would like to marry this person. The drill hound is a somewhat unsuccessful mesh of a traditional rocket launcher weapon with the spitting hydras lock onto multiple enemies at once style. I didn't find myself using it a lot. It's just not as powerful as I think it needs to be to make up for its slow speed or how it interrupts movement to use properly. The Droid Repulsor is an attempt to bring shields back into Ratchet to moderate success, but its most useful ability to catch enemy bullets and spit them back out like the Suck Cannon doesn't actually unlock until it's already fully upgraded to level 5, which seems like a bit of a waste. The Cold Snap freezes enemies, big or small, inside comically large ice cubes and leaves them open to damage. It's the closest this game gets to a Morpho Ray. The Bombardier creates a small mini turret which flies above the battlefield instead of being left in a set position. The Black Hole Storm is perhaps the most realistic weapon the series has ever had, looking like a straight up cross between a minigun and an LMG, which appropriately fires dozens and dozens of rounds a second in a wide burst after spinning up, ejecting shells to spill all over the ground at your feet. It also uses an overheating mechanic. I quickly became eager to see what Rift Apart would do with long range weaponry, given the extended draw distances and tech that seemed more equipped to promote long range stuff than prior titles and the headhunter was the answer. While enemies don't quite react to it from a distance as well as they could, this is the first time that a sniper weapon has been one of my favorites to use in a Ratchet title. Zooming in allows you to slow down time for a brief moment to line up your shot, and the gun feels powerful enough to make it really satisfying to nail an enemy in a weak spot without just one-shotting everything in sight. It doubles as a great rifle, and when it upgrades to level five, its name changes to the Migraine which is hilarious. The Rhino 8 is here as well, buildable for free once you find the plans hidden in infobots across the worlds. It creates huge explosions which deal massive damage in an expanding dome, but also hilariously opens up its own dimensional rifts, dropping in random visual assets on top of foes, whether they be boats or other enemies, a sly Cooper van, or even a Thunderjaw from Horizon Zero Dawn. It's like, uh, wow. The returning weapons from previous games include the Buzz Blades. You know them, you love them. I saw these in a little hologram before they unlocked and I got so giddy, I love this weapon. The Warmonger Rocket Launcher has appeared in several games by this point. I'd say more so for its reliability than its appeal. It packs a punch, however, it's pretty flavorless and on high difficulties is basically essential to beating heavier foes. The Bouncer, this veteran weapon returns and actually has a usable rate of fire for once. Huh. It only unlocks on challenge mode, just like the Pixelizer. The Pixelizer was a rather annoying novelty shotgun seen in the 2016 film tie-in game. It degrades enemies, both physically and audibly, into bit-crushed chunks, and I honestly can't think of a less pleasant way to play this gorgeous game. And the Glove of Doom, a weapon all the way from Ratchet & Clank 1, is back as well. And alongside some enemy designs from that game too, it's really quite nice to see Rift keeping the originals in the loop and paying them their due. And quite impressive to know that even exact enemies and weapons from so many years ago 
feel right at home here. And technically, the classic blaster, the combustor, makes an appearance in this game as well. A small nod to a weapon that I never really gelled with, but I nonetheless enjoyed. Now, what's important to understand about Rift's combat uh, and the use of its weapons and what will be difficult to convey to those not familiar with the PlayStation 5 controller is how centrally the triggers of the DualShock 5 itself play into the firefights and weapon design. This is the first game I've played on a PS5 and I can assure anybody who's not sold on the idea of haptic feedback inside triggers and more sensitivity in control vibration like just in general trust me it this is a really big deal the controller vibration as well as the resistances you feel on the triggers of the DualShock 5 is an area of extreme detail and benefit to not only combat but the entire game this really does matter. At the most basic level, if your controller is set to the default experiential vibration setting, your controller will do its best to physically transport you into the game. For example, your footsteps will cause a rumble that coincides with the pace and weight of your feet hitting the ground. You'll feel the exhale as Rivet launches into a jump, and then when she lands, both are represented by the individual small rumbles. Every individual round fired from a gun has its own level of buzz to the point where rapid firing weapons like the lightning rod or the black hole storm sometimes has my finger physically shaking to hold it down confirming every shot fired the touch that really got me that i actually had to pause and gather myself for a second was how i could feel the side chained kick drum of a nightclub's booming electronic music playing dimly through a wall in the palm of my hands as i approached the nightclub the vibration and side chaining became more extreme and as I walked away, it slowly faded. Have you thanked your Emperor today? If not, now would be an excellent time. I... 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 I can't explain... But equally as important in the trigger's resistances are the multiple types of firing that it allows per weapon. It sounds a little cumbersome to say initially, hold the trigger down halfway to charge your shot and then pull the whole way to unleash it, but in practice it really becomes second nature. Depending on the weapon, there'll be like a, a tactile bump about halfway down the depress that takes more effort to press against, sometimes two. So using the novel twists of a lot of guns here, whether it's charging a shot or switching from precise single firing to spread triple bursts, is a lot easier done than said. The enforcer shotgun fires once when you press halfway and then a second time when you go even further. Trust me, it feels a lot better to use than it sounds to explain, but the possibilities here are enormous and very well used. Each weapon has its own distinct rhythm and physical feeling of use. They are all unique in your hand. But as a result of the attention paid to not only the controller vibration, but these extra twists that the DualShock 5 and PS5 can add to combat, Rift Apart is able to map its combat controls to buttons that feel really natural by sometimes putting three functions in one place and convey a sense of physical feedback in the combat which no other title in the series was technologically capable of doing. This game truly just has more to work with. It has an ace up its sleeve of, oh, I can basically put two different guns in one gun because the triggers let me. So at this point, comparing how any other game here designs its combat and how it feels to play just isn't quite fair. This is a different ball game, but it still has every other trick in the book. There's so much detail and finesse to every single weapon here for these reasons. I'm certain there are uses to each that I just haven't discovered yet. Every weapon has at least two levels of detail and usability to it. It appears as though none of them was included which wasn't unique from every other option available or included a unique effect to its fire type which cements its usefulness in any and every encounter. I can only really say you know what gun you're firing based on how it feels to pull the trigger in like on the controller. To me this is insane. 
like I said, this is the first game I've played on the PlayStation 5, and I'm actually pretty glad that this particular combat is the first time that I've experienced this haptic feedback stuff. I already know there's going to be titles further down the line utilizing this tech in deeply immersive ways to enhance visceral story moments and create unforgettable virtual experiences, but I also know that I've been having more and more trouble with virtual violence as the years have gone on, and there's absolutely going to be games in which this tech is used uh, where I'll need to navigate this emotionally, especially combining haptic feedback with virtual reality in the context of gunfire. That's not something I know how I might react to in the moment, but I know my own bar for tolerance on this stuff, and I think getting this sort of feedback and getting used to it within this game is a good first step. And just to be a little self-aware, I'm more aware than ever of the double think that I'm risking across my whole channel now in taking such delight in the combat and these weapons when I've been so openly questioning of video game violence in many shapes and forms. But I think if anything, my physical reaction to the rumble in this game never quite settling in, and the depth of the potential here kind of scaring me lets me know that I do need to find some way to expand what it is about violence in games that I do enjoy and why this particular game, while most of the time feeling pretty punchy and brutal, doesn't actually make me uncomfortable. This is a larger discussion for another day, but I just want to clear up now that I don't get to decide those moments, just as anybody would it. What makes me like sort of sick or self-conscious in a virtual sense isn't something I choose. And when I speak about it on this channel, it's me trying to understand those reactions on a very case-by-case -case basis as pertaining to the game at hand. And I think the best case scenario in any circumstance, as is the case with Rift Apart, is that participating in this combat didn't conjure anything up that I didn't feel as though I was seeking out to begin with. It didn't make me question myself or question why I felt the way I did in a negative way. Shooting things in the game was fun, and it may not be my regular tune, but yeah, if it causes reactions in line with the game's larger apparent goal, I don't see it as a problem. Because, you know, violence doesn't need to be fun, it just, it all depends on the game, and it's not a voluntary reaction. But I'll be speaking in a bit more detail about this a little later. Adding even more physical feedback to this combat, the Lombaxes can stumble when they get hit, so both the enemies and the player character are getting thrown around by enemy firing. But the stumbling is a fun way to increase, again, the amount of feedback that this combat involves, and make it a more full body affair for the Lombaxes, like they're physically exerting themselves, and does a better job of indicating health loss than just a decreasing number at the top of the screen. Getting back to the weapons, the rare Retanian system of upgrades returns, unlocking and buying cells of individual sort of helpful upgrades for each weapon with a secondary rare Retanium currency. I don't want to roll over on my dislike of these. The constructor weapon system from Crack, I think was vastly superior in every conceivable way. I don't think Rift quite in the presentation side of things does enough to emphasize what each weapon gains every time they level up through use, particularly the fifth levels where I would often need to navigate to a menu to figure out which extra feature it unlocked. Sometimes even guns I would be using regularly would have extra firing modes I was unaware of for hours, like the headhunter building in an ability to fire multiple shots at the same time by holding the trigger delicately. But more immediately apparent is that each level up unlocks more cells for rare titanium upgrades, which I guess allows me to feel more involved in the upgrade process. Even if rare titanium becomes so abundant that this is a mere formality after a certain point, it doesn't take extra work after a certain point, farming rare titanium on challenge modes feels like a chore, it's just an artificial collectathon. it's still something I suppose to work for, and it's a system that the game seemed committed to by this point, but I just don't like it. The Constructo system from Crack accomplishes all of these same feelings with an added cosmetic twist, encourages more exploration and player expression, and there's no reason that both of these systems couldn't be included in a future game at some point. The rare titanium system isn't custom weaponry, it's just locking more upgrades behind another currency and devaluing the upgrade feeling accomplished through gameplay. On the surface, this is the same sort of shoot and loot, vendors for weapons, crates for ammunition and health, not needing to reload kind of shooting gameplay that, at this point, has outlasted the industry's infatuation with hyper-realism in its guns. 
The trend has come back around to favour cartoony stylized combat like this, and I can't say that I'm not glad for the familiarity. I'd say this arsenal perfectly suits the enemies here and allows for a lot of different approaches to great skirmishes using these incredibly intuitive controls. You all know I'm a sucker for my nether beasts, razor claws and scorpion flails, and Christ I'd love to see the melee firearms shown some love in a future installment, but all told it's basically a wash. From a design and control standpoint, Ratchet Combat has never been better than this, and it's still a killer system to play. So much fun, so much fun. Hey, uh, yeah, weird question. You wouldn't happen to know anything about building a Dimensionator, would you? Ratchet? Ratchet! Gary, <laughs> your your reputation precedes you. Yeah. You'll need to go <laughs> to the interdimensional archives. My apprentice can help you. But uh... town under attack. How did you know? I'll go check it out. I think I still remember how to stop an invasion. In speaking about a bunch of other stuff that Rift has expanded on for the series, there's something that I'd like to do. And it is sort of a unique moment for me. I apologize if this seems like an ego trip, but I've spoken about the series a fair bit before and have recorded examples of areas that I wanted expanded on when I believed that we'd maybe never see another entry. So in February 2020, I had the best timing possible and released a five and a half hour video speaking on the first seven entries of this series. Now at that time, Rift Apart had not yet been announced. That occurred in June 2020. And even after then, as I do with pretty much every game I plan on actually playing, I kept myself very in the dark about its details in the lead up to its release, and then made my video on Ratchet Nexus. So, if you go back and watch my original video, there are a handful of major things that I asked for, spoke about, criticized things that I liked about each entry that, too often for me not to geek out about, Rift Apart has directly addressed or expanded on in some way or another. To insane benefit. In some of these cases, it was a dream come true. If I had been in rooms making the game, I would have asked for exact things that are now here and the timeline proves it. So while I truly doubt that anybody who made this game from Insomniac Offices has seen my video or gives a shit about it at all, it's still a strange rarity to have asked for a series to do something and for it to have actually happened in a later entry. As a content creator, yeah, but more importantly, as a lifelong fan of a property. So the first is obviously the Phantom Dash. Now I criticized the lack of innovation in movement during the combat starting from Deadlocked and specifically mentioned how a dash would suit the games more than once. And I doubled down on this during Tools of Destruction. Here's a clip. I am kind of tired of so few movement options on the ground in combat. It seemed like the easiest way to jazz up deadlocked and it's another missed opportunity here to give Ratchet some kind of sideways or backwards dash, some way to cover more ground in the heat of fights and make better use of larger spaces. Perhaps it's me just pining for more melee options or my deep inner desire for Ratchet to become a hack and slash as well as a shoot em up with combos and chains and skill trees, something very different than what it is, but I'm just walking around here flipping scenes less necessary than ever and I like the athletic acrobatic nature of Ratchet too much to be fully satisfied with it not moving further in that direction in a moment to moment sphere and only in a gadget sphere. I want a more athletic movement style to give the game the ability to be as fast paced as it wants to be during its most central gameplay type. I spoke about the hover boots later and I said while not really solving the combat problems as changing the nature of combat within Kraken Time's worlds. By re-emphasizing movement outside of combat and increasing the amount of platforming challenges, shooting no longer seems like the point of the game, and by expanding on movement in that way, Ratchet becomes more fun to just embody and be in general rather than just focusing on having fun shooting stuff as him. Again, it doesn't solve the restricted movement within combat, but a better balance between platforming and combat was struck and crack that I enjoyed that I wanted basically the series to continue doing. So Rift Apart finally adds in the in-combat dash, which this combat feels like it's been missing for about 15 years. And just like strafing and multiple quick select pages, this feature is so beneficial and so well suited that I suspect going back to the games which don't include it 
is gonna be difficult. Mostly because there's no real reason I'm aware of as to why it couldn't have been here before, and the game doesn't need to drastically alter anything else that it's doing by introducing it. The only movement options that have been lost in this game are the helipack, long, and high jumps, which I will miss, but have both historically been fairly restrictive in their use, and have been effectively replaced here by much more widely applicable tools several times over. The main use of the helipack long jump, or the thruster pack boost if you like, in prior games was like a roll in Ocarina of Time. You spam it to cover longer stretches of the ground more quickly than just walking. The thing here is that it's been replaced by the dash, the hover boots, and now sprinting as well, which is a subtle addition, but another one that I also enjoy. Now the helipack high jump would have been lucky if I used it more than a dozen times in a functional circumstance in any title in which it was included. The double jump could already basically do what it does and feels way more natural to use, obviously. The level design of Rift also doesn't require either of these two tools, and the game would then need to explain why both Kit and Clank have helipacks when canonically it's a mod that Clank received after he met Ratchet. But I digress. The dash in particular is such a clean open space to replace both of these uses, and the execution on the dash provides outstanding benefit to combat but platforming as well. Platforming now includes the dash, which might behave in a similar way that Cappy does in Mario Odyssey to an extent. By combining the use of the hover boots, their acceleration, the helipack or glide boots with the phantom dash, Ratchet and Rivet can cover insane amounts of ground in extremely fun ways. The worlds never get too difficult on the platforming side of things, but there's definitely spaces to just enjoy the movement and see if you can set fun platforming goals for yourself with the tools. There's now also some cool Prince of Persia style wall running included as well, which just like 90s fashion had something of a phase many years ago, which has come back in recent years. It never actually lost its cool factor to me. I've always enjoyed this idea. I think the few times that it's used on slightly more challenging platforming runs here in Ratchet, are incredibly satisfying to play. The swing shot has returned as well as a new twist called the hurl shot. Functionally, the hurl shot accomplishes the same task that the wrench activated catapults had been doing or the bounce pads from games prior, but it's in a fun way to economize the function so that it meshes with the other moves available and keeps things flowing and kinetic. There's also the use of rift travel inside the levels themselves, whether positioned at certain points throughout combat arenas or acting as platforming jumps, you can use your Omni Glove to pull yourself through a rift. It's this strange effect where you move seamlessly from one area of the map to another by like skipping physical space. I don't know how it's accomplished exactly, but in practice it kind of feels like Rivet or Ratchet is moving on the spot and the world is moving around them. It's a really neat effect that I honestly never quite became used to, since it locks you into a certain animation and you can't really enter through a rift in any other way than straight on. It feels best in platforming as a finishing touch to arrive at an area, like a full stop, rather than placed in the middle of a course. In combat, these rifts become what Bioshock Infinite wishes it could have been, allowing for instantaneous travel across set points on the map. You can't quite reach them from long distances, but they're a handy escape method if need be, and I would sometimes find myself using them with like a yeah, why not attitude. It costs nothing and adds a lot of fun to the encounters. I don't know if there are any plans for DLC, but if there are, more pocket dimensions focused on using these insane platforming tools together in extended sequences is something I think that I and many others would enjoy. The benefit that they bring to the game is already there, but I'd really love to see these tools pushed to their limit. As for the combat benefit, oh, this isn't exactly what I expected of a dash, but the direction it's gone is impressively thoughtful and informs the enemy design to a significant degree as well. There's a lot of redirection ability to the combat now. You're able to jump to one side, flip to the other, then dash back, forward or backward. There's complete control over trajectory and speed. It feels fantastic to fake in one direction then dash to the other, like you're able to think and move two steps ahead. While it does move the character in a chosen direction, the dash is most of use for the frames of invincibility that it offers, so it's in response to damage letting a player move through enemy attacks or beams or even their physical forms. Learning telegraphs is therefore quite helpful, and there's something really satisfying to taking down an intense foe without ever taking a hit through its masterful use. It adds the spice of perfectly performing a platforming section to combat itself. So it does take skill, that's important. You have to land before you're allowed to use it again. It's not chainable to itself and you can't be firing a weapon while dashing. So overusing it will stop you being able to dish out your own punishment. So you have to dance carefully between 
offensive tactics, self-preservation, and the occasional mad dash for nanotech or cover. The visual effect to show its use I think is really ingenious. Turns out it's easy to keep track of where your character is moving when there's six of them floating on the screen in the same direction. Furthermore, once the character lands, there's something of a pause where their shadow clones will need to catch up and reconstitute in the lead form. It's like a physical echo of the character, but you still land on both feet. You come to something of a stop. It's not a grinding halt, but using a dash lightly arrests the rest of your inertia. So knowing when to use it is still important because you'll need to account for that short pause when your echoes are catching up. This helps put an immediate stop on abusing the dash to gain ridiculous speeds or avoid taking damage altogether by spamming it. You will always be landing, you will always be vulnerable at some point, and it's still on you to keep the rest of your movement efficient and moving. You still need to have a good command of every tool. The dash is a serious highlight and injects this game's combat with a whole lot more flow and fun from a player point of view than I could have imagined possible. In addition, the hover boots have been juiced up as well and finally feel as good to use as they did in Crack by focusing them back on speed rather than maneuverability like Nexus seemed to think they were good for. If you pump your hover boots four times in Rift Apart, you'll accelerate into speeds which kind of rival what a vehicle would be able to achieve in the same Savali environment where you first pick up the hover boots. And I can't tell you how grateful I am that this direction was chosen over something like a buggy, like all the Ratchet games would have chosen in the past. Economizing the speed of movement across this vast area to Ratchet and Rivet themselves is absolutely the right move. It allows more flow into the various other states of play. It also means that you can achieve these speeds on any planet you want since they're an item, not a vehicle. And since it takes the work of pumping to accelerate, it also takes time to implement and is, again, harder to abuse within combat. So it introduces a high level of potential, but there's a limitation to it just like the dash has. The movement, therefore, in this game has had this serious boost relative to previous titles, and it's not a case of too little too late. This is exactly something I'd been asking for and then some, altering the nature of combat and platforming further than I could have anticipated. This movement is so, so good. In line with this open plane on Savali is another major point that I spoke about in my original retrospective. That being Ratchet's potential for open world gameplay given its open world tools. How if one simply expanded on the ideas already present in its second entry and took the various types that it has in separate places and put them together, you would get a game that's up to date today and not dissimilar to, with somehow extraordinary specificity, Horizon Zero Dawn. This game might not be the combination of No Man's Sky and Mario Odyssey that I mentioned was a pipe dream, but still. Y'all can't even tell me I didn't call this a mile out. To see Ratchet and Clank return to its unique takes on level design in full force is something I've really, really missed. How one section can be a linear smash and grab prison break with grind boots and circular arenas fitting as naturally as anything, but then the next level is open and expansive and has you flying all about the place collecting crystals. And to see it go bigger than ever on Savali was absolutely thrilling. I wanted larger worlds and it's exactly what I got. Both Sargasso and Savali hit that spot and incorporate shades of crack space navigation too, with separate islands and small challenges giving small rewards for optional tasks. There's so much more room to grow, and while yeah, I'd maybe love to someday see a Ratchet game that takes place on like two or three massive worlds that are trying to do full-on space exploration, for now I'm happy with this. Ratchet flirts with so many different game styles and they all feel like they belong in this one space. It's something I've spoken about a lot before in regard to the series core, and to see it truly captured in this new entry in the same way is exhilarating. The team may not share senior staff with the older entries, but it's good for exactly the same reasons. They really know what makes a Ratchet and Clank game work when it's at its best. Rift also includes several areas, including pocket dimensions, where exploration will lead to upgrades which directly impact or complement gameplay, just like Crack had. The highlight here is the rethought armor system. You can unlock a chest piece, a set of pants, and a third piece you should never use if you have taste, and each piece of armor will provide benefits to your character whether you're wearing them or not. These upgrades are things like a 10% decrease on taking damage from a certain enemy type, or gaining extra bolts per piece of armor that you find. So you're allowed to mix and match different pieces of armor with each other and change the colors to your liking as well. This is a cosmetic shot in the arm that seems like a long time coming, 
I know I've wanted a hide helmet option available in every game since number two, and if the old school armor approach had been implemented, it would feel like a missed opportunity for this customization. It's a great addition. But the thing here is that Ratchet and Clank feels more aware than ever of how complementary open world stylings like customization and massive worlds are to this formula that's already here. It hasn't shied away from including straight up contained open worlds, which prove exactly what I was talking about with the open world applicability of the second game's core design, because it's done exactly what I wanted. It's combined the exploration and collection of Ratchet 2's desert section with a more complex landscape, including structures and something like enemy bases or strongholds. It's improved the movement across it by making Ratchet's shoes into vehicles like a sparrow from Destiny. It contains mobs out in the world like Horizon Zero Dawn, where you can plan out attacks from a distance, and it's all in the shadow of a massive moving structure which is visually impressive and representative of a living world around you, but also presents a long-term end goal for this whole level. It has NPCs with whom to converse and added depth to each facet of the initial concoction. I'd love to see this idea taken further if, someday, Ratchet & Clank decides to put away the idea of sequential levels for a day or two, and make a truly unique Ratchet game by wholly embracing the open world leanings of its toolset. But for now, again, I called it, and I'ma do a little dance about it. This is an ocean. Pretty cool, right? And just think, once we forge this thing and save the dimension, you'll have a whole universe to explore. How are you not afraid of the future? With all of its unknowns. I do get, uh... Well, you asked me on Savali if I wanted to find my family. For a long time, I did. I mean... <laughs> I really did, but the closer I got to doing that, what if they're not what I expected? What if I'm not what they expected? I just... Anyways, I think we're here. In a slightly more serious story manner, during the Tools of Destruction section in my original retrospective, I went on a big old personal monologue about power fantasy, about how this game's story structuring itself around Ratchet's identity as a Lombax, and making that the centerpiece, how that creates a more stark power dynamic in the game, directing praise toward a player for doing questionable violent things without enough cause. I spoke about how enemy NPCs were basically the only living things in the galaxy, and how going out of my way to kill them created a cold experience when the motivation to do so, or the reason why I was allowed to do that, was just, you're a hero Lombax who is being hunted, so you're allowed. I cited the improvement of this idea in A Crack in Time, given that narrative centralization of the Great Clock for its story and theme, rather than any particular character, but more on that in a minute. It's a, it's a really sort of personal idea, but a lot of it links up with my consistent desire from the very first entry to decrease the significance that Ratchet and Clank feel like they exude in platforming stages by making more realistic worlds and including more civilian populations in levels like Quest and Crack would eventually begin to do. The point of that being to show that if Ratchet and Clank are just like anybody else in the galaxy, and the worlds in the games don't feel, in a meta way, made for them and only them to traverse, the games have an easier time employing their power fantasy in a more tasteful way than you are a rand of special Lombax who is allowed to kill anybody. You can invade the Kirchu homeworld after leading the tyrannical monarch there in the first place. By the way, kill the natives who are just defending their home, collect money from their corpses, by making more realistic worlds and keeping the civilians of those worlds in mind makes stuff like this happen less. Civilian populations in Ratchet and Clank levels carries with it the need to think about how people other than those equipped with helipacks and weapons and grind boots would navigate through the environments, and so create spaces that actually feel as though they belong and operate for reasons other than making a fun video game. Places that diegetically make sense, contain more areas which aren't purpose-built for just combat, and show that Ratchet just isn't going into places with a gun without any real authority mercilessly capping people in their own homes. 
Additionally, in my video on Nexus, I spoke about the potential benefit of adding more characters to the Ratchet and Clank dynamic to refuel their plot relationship. I mentioned the Nether Beast weapon in particular, but in a wider way, was just talking about how expanding on their dynamic could work by telling different stories with more new characters. Along with addressing a lot of this realism stuff directly, in the same breath, Rift Apart also takes the time to improve on something the 2016 tie-in game and film didn't do either, building out the universe with more creatures in a lore-friendly way. It never actually occurred to me until I was watching the Ratchet and Clank film, but it's actually sometimes oddly difficult to put a face to a name of the Polaris, Bogon, and Solana galaxies. Civilian populations have been present to some extent in various levels, but in the film specifically, there were like fungoids on Metropolis. The last place a fungoid would ever be. It's one of the most iconic locations in the series, but I don't know what kind of people actually live there. And it goes to show that occasionally the abandoned locations that created levels in a more technologically limited era actually robbed the games early in the series of defining traits of identity that it's taken too long to remedy. Why aren't there any people in the cities? And it became more apparent in the 2016 game that the need to build out each planet as an environment with its own unique inhabitants who weren't enemies was long past overdue, if not simply so that the stories would hold up. The risk was continuing to tell grand tales about saving the universe without seeing or interacting with anybody you're actually saving. Casts of surrounding characters can only do so much when the scope is, apparently, the entirety of existence. Given the similarities of Emperor Tachyon to Emperor Nefarious and the difference in how both villains come across as a result of comparing their worlds and these included inhabitants, I've never been more certain in my criticisms of tools, because Rift tells a very similar story in such an improved way. First of all is the abundance of civilian population on nearly every planet that you visit. It's not just the bar at Xerxes that's full of life and color with different castes of people in there at different parts of the story. The docking port on the way in showcases tons of different species of people, some boasting new designs and some familiar. There are hostile goons for less than hostile pirates, but also docile members in some areas too. There are levels of interaction besides open confrontation, which gives so much needed depth to the enemies and shows their own level of agency in choosing to be violent with you. These smaller sides with these enemies here show that they're choosing to fight Rivet, so even if they're just normal dudes, combat feels more like defense than aggression, particularly when combat is not the goal of many of these levels. The detail and the conversations that NPC civilians have with each other on these worlds is of such benefit, where you'll be able to listen in on small conversations between people, have a polite brief exchange with them, which means that there's never a moment where these worlds and characters disappear unless an absence of people enhances the atmosphere that it's going for. Hi there! Good to see you. I am glad you have decided to return. There's a fair amount of detail in how this comes across as well, like the way civilians move throughout their environment is very well animated, and the way that they're written to talk to each other is interesting too. The Ruby on Forge researchers, each at the, at the little desks that you can visit, each speak about something that's seen elsewhere in the game, or sheds light onto another aspect of the story. One station speaks about needing to juice fluctuating power levels, explaining how the creature was given their name by Junkbot, who was also the Forgebot in a different dimension. Forge at 80% heat capacity, increasing seawater coolant flow. Power levels are fluctuating again. We may need to juice them. Another station speaks about Nefarious' plans to build the giant mech that he uses at the end of the game. So, what exactly did he want? Well, for it to walk! Sure, okay. Shoot lasers of unspeakable power! Ooh, tricky, but doable, yeah. Ideal vector. for a hundred stories tall! Uh, 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 sorry about that. My processor just broke. <laughs> 
The third station mentions their shortage of rare retanium and needing a new shipment, quite possibly relating to a wrecked shipment of rare retanium found on Savali. The power button on the forge likely had the death symbol painted on it because it harms the creature in the pod. There are other pods all around the forge, including amoeboids, uh, researching other creatures showing how they came to exist in force in the abandoned dimension. So there's so much detail going on here, including civilians like this and showing them having conversations means there's constant storytelling going on. I feel like I'm interacting with the universe instead of it revolving around me and my character. A lot of these civilians' visual designs flesh out the series universe as well, improving the amount of creatures I know to exist within this galaxy and further highlight the uniqueness of the Lombax peoples in relation to them. Unlike Nexus, Rift manages to repurpose older character designs across the whole game, like amoeboids and blogs, within a visual style that retains its cohesion. So if I didn't know any better, it would look like all of these NPCs were purpose-built for this one game. I'm grateful and impressed that the universe of Ratchet feels more like a real place than ever before, with these new kinds of people and robots and characters without ever feeling completely unrecognizable. It's a difficult balance to strike and perhaps more subtle work than I gave it credit for. But in addition to this is the presence of Rivet and Kit, two new PCs who, among so much else, directly offset the significance that Ratchet and Clank feel as though they have in so many of their other adventures. While, yeah, they're dimensional counterparts or whatever, it does a lot for the game that they split up the work, coordinate their movements, and each have different emotional arcs in the story. They act very much as a team. It doesn't feel like Ratchet could have done this by himself, and allows for more humanistic elements of their stories to come forth without clashing with the violent, aggressive nature that they're not addressing. Ratchet is nervous about how long it's been since he went on an adventure and is insecure about the possibility of meeting Lombaxes. Clank is struggling with feeling responsible for things going wrong in the first place, and they're both humanized by their need to explain what's going on here to a third party. Rivet, in turn, is dealing with being an underdog and how many times she's failed to defeat Nefarious already, and Kit is in a state of denial and a dangerous amount of self-hate, feeling as though she's a broken thing who should never get close to anyone in case she hurts them, based on how she hurt Rivet in the past. What I'm saying is there's been a lot of work done to make more of a story surrounding who the characters are as people, highlighting their choices. You know, not just who they were born as. Along with Prophet Gary, Captain Quantum, Pierre Lefaire, and Phantom, and eventually when all of their enemies turn around and fight Nefarious alongside them, to see Ratchet and Clank, amongst so many other remarkable individuals, actually out fighting in the field, and not just cordoned off, plays a huge role in recontextualizing the struggle against Emperor Nefarious as more than just a power fantasy. The threat of that villain is simply against more people. The miners are here, just trying to go about their day, and in the Blizzard Prime level, a look directly at the kind of society that was lost by moving to a different dimension here highlights the plight that all of the universe is in. The sheer amount of working people here just going about their day, some with their own dreams to like cook or discover rare minerals who would have died when the other Blizzard Prime was destroyed. You know, millions of voices crying out in terror and then suddenly silenced. It's not just Ratchet and Clank themselves, there's other fighters here doing what they can, and a huge number of ordinary people caught in the middle. So while on the surface, the statues in Nefarious's honor, the quest to rule everything, and the abuse of dimensional technology for his own gains is derivative of particularly Emperor Tachyon in major ways, there's a far better understanding and conveyance of the stakes of that villain in this universe in which the story plays out. Looking back at the PlayStation 2 games, people have often cited enjoying the feeling of the universe and the tone of it as overarching reasons to enjoy the series at all. And it's a really important difference that the tone of this universe comes more from the characters than it ever has before. It's not scared to actually make Ratchet look like a normal guy in a normal place, and I really, really love that. Additionally, there's a lot of barks early in the game from NPCs particularly about working conditions forced upon people in this dimension, often for nefarious causes. People aren't energized to fight back because he'll kill them or put them in a jail and then kill them, so simply accept their lot in life instead. It's often played for humor, but it's frequent that an NPC will speak about getting to their 40th straight hour of working without a break with some self-aware pride in their tone or something similar. So there's devotion to Emperor Nefarious in some way, but also a bit of an understanding of what's really going on from all the NPCs talking like this. 
the juice part of the Ruby on Forge actually centralizes the after effects of awful workplace practices into a mission instead of just using the setting or the tone of that as a backdrop, which even though it's been a consistent thread in several of the games, is this the first time that it's been actually the point of a mission? I'm not sure about that, but it certainly feels unique. This does a whole lot for the game. It helps frame Rivet and Co's struggle against Nefarious as a resistance with something real behind it, seeing why it's needed for a reason that's really easy to get on board with, to see how the tyranny in combination with his abuse of dimensions affects the every person and not just her is central to what makes this story and universe so engaging and full. He'd be worth fighting at the best of times and the Dimensionator is just the icing on the cake to make the threat more immediate. Doing further work to explain the story of how she lost her arm is another layer to explain her personal investment in fighting him. So she's got multiple layers to her desire to defeat Nefarious. To imply that they have something of a history with Nefarious always coming out on top is a really difficult thing to convey, but the game does it to great success while weaving Kit in there as well and allows Rivet to feel like as rich a character as Ratchet does from the outset. Kit too. Showing the effects of Nefarious's rule on multiple levels with the world building and character building like this helps motivate and contextualize the combat, the plot, the motion of each level and each individual character's arc on a backdrop that one can actually see and understand. It's real, it's here in the levels themselves. You can touch it, you can speak to an NPC, you can affect their behavior. The enemies that you fight are different from the people that you're defending. So the lights of character growth like Ratchet or Clank themselves aren't just floating really brightly in a sea where all else is pretending that it isn't as dim as it actually is. It's also in the spirit of making comment on how capitalism can force people away from each other and separate the worker from the means of production definitely carries the tone of the first two games back into the fold somehow. And since it enhances the plot and characters directly here, and it's been reported that Rift Apart was, at least for some departments, completed without crunch, for the first time in the series, this commentary on capitalism and consumerism and bad working conditions isn't overplaying its hand in one of the games, is actually enhancing the way the game feels to play and is coming from a company who are practicing what they preach. I mean, a Ratchet and Clank game in which development constraints aren't centrally informing design, where I don't have to read stories on Kotaku about, you know, people getting major mental disorders from working so hard. That's a change if there ever was one. Congrats to Insomniac for improving on this. I hope it continues to get better. But overall, the better world building is an aspect that Tools dearly needed, that Crack used to the best of its ability, that Nexus totally dropped, and I'm delighted to see it come back here as a full-on priority, stronger than ever before. These places feel like real places, and I absolutely love to see it. Must be glitch. I'm Ratchet. Sorry for all the jostling around earlier. Things aren't exactly going well, and actually, I think you're the only one who can help me right now. Thanks. Ratchet. Huh. And seems like a nice guy. I probably just have to delete some files, and then he'll be all set. I continuously spoke about variety as relevant to Ratchet and Clank in my large retrospective. In this series, I've always wanted to see variety weaved into the games elegantly to evict unnecessary gameplay types, and that if one of the games was going to include a supplementary game type, it'd damn well better commit to it, make sure it has some meat on the bone, or make certain that the inclusion of that variety enhances the rest of the experience of the game. I'm against basically variety for its own sake, despite knowing that it's important for the series to include especially since the combat of Ratchet already has variety, progression, player choice all woven into the same place. So if there's a supplementary mode or method of variety, I don't want it to just feel different and has to link back to the core of the game in a meaningful way. This is perhaps the area that Crack, I think, still has Rift beats quite handily, if not only for the great clock sections alone. While there is an elegance to Rift Apart's supplementary modes, there's hints of the game trying to replicate Crack in this regard without following through as hard. And the two aspects of the game which are the most underwhelming belong here. 
The first are the hacking sections with glitch, which replicate the Leviathan vehicle sections from Deadlocked to an extent, but speed them up a whole lot, make the device slash vehicle a character, and have something of a small story about that character, glitch, finding their confidence and strength to oppose a big scary galaxy-wide Zeta virus. Now, Glitch is cute as hell, and I think the game's overall decision to make their vehicles characters instead, with both Glitch and Trudy, is of huge benefit. It allows Rivet in particular to feel extremely well attuned to nature, the people and surroundings on Sargasso. But with Glitch on these virus sections themselves, I think the note that I took while playing them actually says it best. It simply read, look how much work it takes to turn 2D design into 3D space. The virus sections seem a little deluded of their own simplicity. They've thrown a lot of paint and shiny shit onto like a gameplay type that is just really simple and it didn't need to be this overcomplicated. This is basically the same as like a two stick shooter. A, the My Blaster Runs Hot minigame from Crack with a change camera angle. So instead of being top down, it's third person with ultra detailed surroundings. Doesn't need that. But more importantly, this mode with its guns and explosions and tension hits the same pleasure centers of my brain that the regular combat does. So it feels a little pointless. The little story that they tell about the Zeta virus that Glitch is trying to sum up the courage to fight is a really noble attempt to make something out of nothing, but still feels crammed in since they, the Glitch, they can't interact with any other character in the story and are therefore segmented and easy to forget about. The hacking stuff doesn't affect the core of the experience of the game in any way, it just replicates it in a smaller vacuum. These sections are usually pretty brief, which is good. The speed is fine. Architecturally, they're honestly a little confusing, but they're visually quite fascinating, if not hard to appreciate. So there's absolutely room to do a lot worse, and it's doubtful this mode will ruin the game for anybody. Ultimately though, two of them, of the five instances of hacking in the game, are totally optional. So I think it was probably a little bit more trouble than it was worth. Next to that are the moments of dimensional anomalies that both Clank and Kit solve. These areas require the player to find nodes which will alter basically a current flowing through a space to reach the end of this area, like its destination, by either lifting the current over obstacles, speeding it up, weighing it down so it isn't blown off a path, or redirecting it with arrows attached to pressure pads. It's a neat enough idea, but feels oddly just not particularly enjoyable to play. I think I just preferred when Clank had a triple boost. As a result, the environments of these anomalies feel somewhat uninspired visually and quite clunky to navigate. The story behind why this place looks like it does is that this is apparently how Clank perceives and visualizes dimensional anomalies, so this isn't necessarily how they actually look, and I suppose could look different to every person, but in that light, I think there was a bit of a missed opportunity here to show Kit's section in an anomaly in a totally different color scheme or type of world. Clank was the senior caretaker of the Great Clock after all, we've been inside his subconscious before. So it makes sense to me to theme how his mind works after the clock itself or do something else with this space than just a weird colorless void and then reinforce how different Kit is in her head by making what she sees which is different. However, the moments of character dialogue within these anomalies act as a real saving grace and give a glimpse into one of my favorite aspects of Rift Apart in addition. Both Clank and Kit have conversations with Prophet Gary while they complete these puzzles, opening up about their doubts and fears and what they're observing about their Lombax friends. It's a really interesting and wonderful touch to hear what's going on in these relationships from this perspective, and I've always really loved when Clank is positioned as the emotional center of a Ratchet and Clank story. It really is the secret source. So, what do you think of Clank? Oh, talented, resourceful, very shiny. Agreed, agreed, agreed. I can see why he'd be your counterpart. What does that mean? It's a compliment, Kit, to both of you. What do you think of Clank? We have barely spoken, but I am glad my counterpart is a good guy. You were worried about that? It is a reasonable concern. Well, it wasn't for me. You're good. No, great. So of course he would be too.
but this puzzle mode for itself, I think they're pretty irregular and a little too sparse and simple when there's definitely room to expand on them visually or incorporate more optional versions of them. Maybe even replacing the instances of hacking with more of these instead. But the levels themselves that Rivet and Ratchet can walk around in contain an elegance of supreme grace in how they present their variety within themselves. Each level has some deeper trick to it, a hook which makes navigating it unique from every other level or builds on a mechanic which another one had introduced, which is where the detail and compactness of the game really comes into focus. Some levels are reused in the story, but the return trip will alter the location or the weather or the feeling of the space to great effect. So Blizzard Prime introduces the idea of Bleeds on Crystals, which allows Rivet to jump between two alternative versions of the same planet, navigating the same physical space on two different levels. This is so, so cool. Cordelion at the Rubion Forge also includes the Bleeds on Crystals, in a less intensive way, but to hop between alternative level versions. But one of these is a tense, spooky, abandoned shell of a lab hosting an unkillable enemy who stalks you through time-sensitive area navigation and beautifully repurposes amoeboids as I think they were always meant to be. Scary, relentless zombies. And the completely revitalized Zordoom prison from Tools has Rivet following a moving prison cell through the entire complex, conveying a continuous sense of tension and time pressure in foreboding indoor locations, despairing outdoors overlooking an endless sea, and a breakneck moment of explosive insanity where it all falls apart. There isn't a nothing level. There isn't a place that feels underdeveloped or normal or uninteresting. Everything is a standout for one reason or another. It's a roller coaster and it's worth playing the game just to see and experience every actual level. Each of them presents a different core idea, whilst never straying too far from the appeal of the on-foot gameplay in the first place. And there's a level of subtlety and elegance to the variety here that many of the other titles in the series would be envious of. It plays a huge part in what makes this game so exciting to play the whole way through, making sure that the variety complements the core experience and doesn't get in the way or alter it too much. It's so good. What's it? Uh, uh, hey. Hey! Yes, um, hi! Um, I have Clank. <laughs> huh? Oh, pal, I am fine, Ratchet. In fact, I am beginning to like my new look. For the record, I found him like this. Come on, I knew you wouldn't hurt Clank. Pretty sure you're me, after all. Wait! What makes you so sure you're not me? Well, I mean, come on, I, uh, uh, You got nothing. Yeah, I got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Rivet, this is... Kit, I have been looking forward to meeting you. Um, me too. <laughs> uh... I suppose it is time to fix this mess. Do you want to, um... You see, according to Fungoid lore, the Zoni are the guardians of time. Your friend is connected to them. He must play some part in its operation. But now, where are those blasted things? Wait! I thought my father was the only one to stay behind when the Lombaxes left. Why didn't you go with him? Sometimes the universe has a cruel sense of humor. During my crack in time overview, I spoke on what I, or I guess I ruminated on what I thought about thematic trepidation on which its follow-up games doubled down. Because it was an ambitious and different sort of take for the game to actually tell a genuine emotional animated story that the subsequent games completely abandoned. I ruminated on that trepidation. 
The series had always been a property that Insomniac approached with a mind to industry trends and changing it as needed, but when it actually found itself, nothing changed. They kept altering it. It seems certain that the series would never again approach the idea that it could actually improve somebody's life for more than a few hours at a time. And letting those potential stories go, and understanding that I might never see them, was a process of looking at my investment in a franchise in a more intimate way than I've had to before. And if Rift Apart was going to get one thing in my book wrong, it was this. Because I've been disappointed so many times that I didn't feel I was right to expect it. Crack was the exception that these games were just, you know, fun, but not a whole lot of heart. Rift Apart may not be my favourite story in the series, and while it emanates the aura of something that's had a bit too much writing cut out of it, it's got the heart. It's got it, thankfully. I was so relieved, and I think it's great to see Ratchet and Clank knowing that's exactly where it fits best. To begin speaking on the story of this game proper, I'd like to start with the new characters that it introduces, and the way it forges a new approachable tone through them that's been executed with a great amount of care. Starting off small, the Monks and Prophet Gary is an interesting twist on friendly NPCs given that they're the same species as the Goons for Less faction that you fight. You know, super buff but peaceful dudes. This creates early on even more nuance in regard to world building and furthers the idea that there are mysteries out in the universe that Ratchet and Clank just haven't come into contact with. It makes perfect sense to me that there would be peaceful societies out there somewhere and it's a lot of fun to see and interact with. The character of Gary in particular is a worthwhile update to the plumber, apparently who is his father, who goes so far back and remains so unexplained that it's definitely wise, at least Nita, to start somewhat fresh. It's always been nice to see the plumber in the games, but the mystery of his omniscience has either been stretched too far to answer adequately, or is, you know, worth taking the time to work into a larger plot further down the line. For now, Gary takes his place, but is a far more active agent, representing something not only of a character shift for this new leg of Ratchet, but also a tonal shift for the whole game. Gary is extremely kind-hearted and friendly. He's just a really nice person, and there's something about that which encourages other characters to open up to him. He acts as something of a passive unit for everybody to talk to, a non-violent, good listener who everyone trusts, while at the same time he needs help from Ratchet to defend Savali and doesn't necessarily have all the answers, and he's a unique character for exactly those reasons. And following with this worthwhile idea of kindness and a total lack of cynicism is Rivet herself, the new playable Lombax character. Rivet acts as one half of the Lombax adventure, and that's mathematical. Both she and Ratchet have the same amount of levels if you include the introductory sequence. It helps that her design is really, really cool, conveying a ton of personality that stops at just the right moment before it gets a little too busy. My favorite touches are her earrings, just tying everything together. Although I do one day long for both her and Ratchet to remove their little hats. They wear them all the time. There's got to be something weird under there. There is something about how Rivet is placed so smoothly into this game that I think I admire with a bit of a sly smirk. It was no doubt a daunting prospect to place a new character in the center of the frame for so much of the game. And the solution to make this work was pretty sneakily good. It's putting Rivet with Clank. What a great choice. There was potential here for cutting to Rivet to cause like a cold introduction and feel too different or like she's replacing Ratchet in the story, but the structure in the early parts of the game and including Clank on board to make her immediately feel included with the larger cast instead of standing separate from them accomplishes a ton. It's also an immediate opportunity to show how she both is and isn't different from Ratchet in relation to Clank. In gameplay, they're functionally identical, something I hope the future games don't repeat, but in regard to character, there's opportunities taken. She initially distrusts Clank, makes sure that he's telling the truth, and then begrudgingly admits that she was wrong. It's an interesting way to both explain the story to people who are unfamiliar with the series and give them a new character to become attached to, whilst at the same time nailing the gymnastics to endear her to longtime fans by creating a unique dynamic between her and Clank. Rivet calling Clank Bolt, or Bolt, doesn't actually have a setup conversation and remains unclear where that comes from, but is a really nice touch to give her and Clank a relationship that is different from his and Ratchet's. While there are definite echoes of Clank and Ratchet's first meeting here, that distrust, their following equal relationship, 
and the subtle social awkwardness on her part is presented masterfully. There's Clank here who I care about to act as a bridge to Rivet until she also becomes someone I'm invested in on her own merits. Ratchet's travelling alone is something that I'm quite used to by this point, so the game is fine with leaving him by himself for a little while, even though the feeling of longing for a companion does come across. So the same method is employed with Ratchet and Kit, allowing Ratchet to act as a bridge from me to her until both Rivet and Kit, which is such a good pairing of names, have appealed to me individually through familiar channels. This is done before they then pair off together, so introducing them both individually alongside the original pair instead of both at the same time is used to its full effect and is some sneakily excellent writing. I know their stories individually, so then I'm also interested in seeing their relationship in the coming conflict before it actually happens. Very, very cool. The ongoing relationship between Rivet and Clank is one of my favourites in the stories from then on, making way for Rivet's individual arc to take place with grace and subtlety. There's many small touches relating to her changing priorities over the game's story, from protecting herself and working alone, to eventually teaming up with Kit at the very end, and being part of a larger group of colourful characters. Being able to see her work alone, visit her home, interact with Clank in a distrustful manner, and have some sort of social facade with the Morts, accomplishes a lot of character building in many kinds of ways rather quickly. She's seen as though she feels more at home on her own, inside a dark cave, separated from a society which is demonstrated as being super social. She's carved out this dark space as hers, and creating this kind of character without too much of a heavy-handed edgelord tone to her disposition is an interesting balance to strike. It's a great character, a loner rogue who isn't also socially inept, completely rejecting of help or just in a sour mood all of the time is a bit of a rarity. And it's another look at, just like with Gary, this tone that the game is apparently going for and leaves behind in my mind. The game is so kind. There's something deeply considerate in how each of these characters speak with each other, making room for emotion and truth, checking in, people opening up. There's often conversations between the pairs while they're out in the world, just triggering at random like party banter in a Dragon Age game that does a lot of this. As a result, I feel like these characters care about each other and what they have to say and feel. The way Rivet promotes this was reportedly a high priority. She's allowed to have her dramatic arc, be initially presented as though she's a loner, be a bit scarred. It makes perfect sense she's gone through tough times in this galaxy and the game does well to convey how that's worn on her. She's been fighting a losing battle against Nefarious, more or less by herself all her life, without a family, without a clank, having lost her arm in the pursuit. That side of her is investigated and isn't shied away from. It's necessary that tones be balanced to convey hope or happiness in the purest form after the fact. Rivet is the centerpiece of that, to convey her tiredness and trauma but also her determination and ability to forgive in equal measure makes her a character worth investing in and worth following from here on out. She's got every reason to throw in the towel, give up, become hateful, prejudiced or unforgiving. Her patience is tested and her trust in her eyes is betrayed by people that she needs. It doesn't take much, but Insomniac choosing to show the strength of positive growth from that environment again and again is worthy of attention and praise. Not to pull cynicism, out of this environment. One of my favourite touches to display this growth is a visual one. When her home is broken into early in the game by a seekerpede, and a magnetic force begins to pull herself, Clank, and an infobot relevant to her mission away, acting on instinct, she reaches first to save the infobot. Later in the game, on Blizzon Prime, when the phase quartz relevant to her mission and Clank are both in the line of fire of the mining drill, it fires up. Acting on instinct, she reaches first for Clank this time. Gotta love it. Thanks go to Jennifer Hale, the absolute legend, for providing such a wonderful vocal performance as this character. Now, about Kit. Kit is positioned to Clank how Rivet is to Ratchet, and arrives as something of an understated surprise. I expect with time, I will come to love this character as deeply as I love Clank, because everything about her, thanks in part to the vocal performance provided by Deborah Wilson, is perfect. 
if the rest of this game had not been so consistently engaging and exciting, Kit would have stolen the show in a single scene. Given how excellently this team knows how to use Clank's best emotional aspects for the story, it should come as no surprise that a self-consciousness and fear hiding an absolute ball of energy and excitement is just as perfect as Clank. Someone put the tears back in my face. I didn't say they could come out just yet. Kit's later introduction to the story means she has less time to shine than the other three major players, and given how much time she spends as a companion, I didn't really think of her as a player character all that much. I suspect her relationship with Clank in particular would have been aided most by spending more time with them together, whether in the field or in cutscenes. I don't think she actually exchanges a single word with him in the whole game, which is just a straight up problem. There are some beautiful moments here though, in particular the scene with both Rivet and Kit discussing the pressure that they kind of feel to emulate their dimensional pair. Ratchet and Clank's friendship has had to go through a lot of stages to get to the point they're at, and it's natural that Kit and Rivet would see that end product and miss the journey leading up to it. Like, it took a time, and like, they fought a lot. Both characters get a little stiff and frozen around each other despite Kit's outward excitement, and it's really well done. This cutscene between Kit and Rivet is beautifully animated, showing somehow how both of them want so desperately for the other one to push for the pairing harder, to be the vulnerable one, but they're just not looking at each other. We will not lose your friends. So if Ratchet is an alternate dimension me, and Clank is an alternate dimension you, were we meant to team up too? They do seem happy together. Yeah. Guess being on my own is just what I'm used to. Me too. So maybe this is just temporary. This is what happens when you put two lone units together. I love it. The subtleties of Kit's animation in her moments are what really pushes her character over the edge from appealing to potentially, if we see more of her in games to come, miracle. She's such an engaging character to watch and listen to, defying, full and human. Watch her hands in any scene, the clenched fists when she's yelling, the small nervous clasping before she chooses her name, her little excited bob when Ratchet says they're gonna go see the Lombaxes before the game's ending screen. Seeing the small worn down pieces of paint across her shell, the lines and gaps in her metal indicating there's more underneath, the warbot form itself looking imposing as hell, this character is special and only good things are allowed to happen to her, okay? Okay, I really, really like Kit and what she brings to this game. But just like Rivet, I think getting more of a gameplay differentiation between Clank and Kit will be important in later installments, particularly if we are one day able to play as her in Warbot form. But it's a great touch to make the most outwardly insecure character of the bunch also the most physically powerful in her raw form. But unfortunately, that's all I could really say for Kit right now. She's a wonderful addition to the roster, and her conversations with Ratchet on Savali are some of my favourites in the whole game, showcasing the best aspects of both characters, but all I really want is more of her and more for her to do. Until that comes, there's only so much I actually have to speak about. So I might as well turn my attention to Team Nefarious. I have to admit that even though, you know, I love me some Dr. Nefarious, I think I'm about done. You know, this this wasn't one game too many, but you know, let's call it here. The guy getting resurrected after a crack in time was, and I know this for a fact, a corporately mandated move. And while he's as magnetic here as ever, with Armin Shimmerman showing no signs of slowing down, I am remiss as to why Insomniac stuck to this choice to keep him alive. There wasn't any further to go with the character. There wasn't. There still isn't. And while using Ratchet and Clank to introduce new companion characters makes sense to me, Using Nefarious to introduce a new Nefarious feels more like a choice of necessity than one of inspiration. Emperor Nefarious is ostensibly if the plans of Tachyon met the brawn of Quark and the self-aggrandization of Dr. Nefarious himself, and he's an occasionally imposing villain who enhances the core cast greatly, but on his own merits, he leans far too heavily on being different from Dr. Nefarious for character traits and contrast, 
and I'm just not entirely sold on him alone as a character. The conviction with which both characters are played is notable, and Emperor Nefarious can at times be a surprising villain with an interesting no qualms maliciousness which lands very well. His opening move of straight disappearing a whole bleacher of onlookers actually packs a punch given how much more heavily civilians are involved in the story so we know what this means, but in the same moment he like displays some kind of telekinetic power which doesn't end up resurfacing at all. I think the shadow of Emperor Nefarious is of greater benefit to the game than he is as a unit and the game does a great job of building him up, but I actually think the brevity of his active role in the story is a grace to it. It's just this is the best I think you can do with this character. I don't think you could do better. I still just don't think it's great. The best you could do with like how overused Nefarious has been by this point is to have Emperor Nefarious not be really annoying and not be a bad villain. I think that's achieved, but I genuinely think that's the best you could hope for. He remains an off-screen, unheard figure for much of the story, but whenever he arrives in person somewhere, you do know that he's gonna do some shit. So he's an active villain to be scared of, enhanced by, you know, his upper-class, suave English performance from Robin Atkin Downs. His recklessness with dimensions works as great contrast to the care and veneration each other character treats the technology with, and building of dislike of him is easy given how handily he seems to defeat characters in cutscenes. As I've said many times before, of many other games, this is not my favourite narrative device to put it lightly, but I think the game is actually pretty reasonable in how it stages these scenes. Like, yeah, no, even if I was in control, I don't think I could win that fight. Yeah, take my thing. So, you know, I'll let it off the hook. I think Emperor Nefarious is a well-executed choice with a well-conveyed history with Riven enhancing his final fight well enough to feel like a long time coming for both characters. His own giant mech is one of the more visually impressive moments in terms of scale I may have seen from my PlayStation title. It's just like so much else in the game, but he rings a little hollow as perhaps the least individual character here, or maybe just as a reminder of how this particular aspect of Ratchet and Clank, Major Villains, hasn't received a solid update for much longer than the series had been dormant to begin with. I'm really looking forward to seeing what Insomniac come up with as a new villain in a follow-up game. I think it's an aspect that's in need of a new approach, just, just call it with Nefarious. We've definitely seen enough of him by now. Improvising. I may be different than I was, but you helped me realize I am still Clank. I am quite relieved. When the bullets asked me to protect them, it opened my eyes to a great many broken things. So very many. And you became distressed. <laughs> but being able to fix another, to see that all is not lost. <laughs> How can I ever repay you both? Can you fix this? <laughs> gave an old giant robot the gift of hope it should be i who is thanking you hmm. let's talk about theme so the stage on torrent 4 while the game's shortest is a spectacle highlight with a truly mind-blowing grind rail sequence involving a giant pacific rim-esque robot named the fixer the irony of the sequence shouldn't go over anybody's head but it's also strangely an emotional moment for me or at least was when I played it. First of all, there's this exchange between Clank and Rivet partway through. Is he talking about me? Because of your arm? Don't listen to him! 
listen to him, Bolts. If you're broken, so am I. And I think we're pretty awesome. And then Clank's improvisation to help the Fixer come out of his despair. This has been preceded with Rivet and Clank when they first approach Torrenfall with a brief exchange about improvising, which helps this brief level feel like a tight, well-contained adventure. But in how it relates to the larger narrative theme is crucial. The core theme I think I detect apparently revolves around the idea of thinking of things as not being broken, but merely changed. It has undertones of a destiny mentality of turning the being who you were supposed to be story trope a little bit on its head, like you are who you're, you're supposed to be. And the story seems to suggest that brokenness in regard to both personality and physical attributes is intrinsically tied to belief that you are only broken if you say you are. Otherwise, you're perfectly you. That your imperfections, whatever that means and whatever that may be, can weigh you down, put you into distress, and be worth working on, but really, there's nothing wrong with you as a person. You could be a completely different person and still be just as beautiful. In the light of disability, I'm not a disabled person, but there are definite allusions toward disability in the story. I do know that part of a recovery process for a person can often involve an acceptance or reworking of who one considers themselves to be, or reworking what you consider to be a real body by addressing ableist beliefs, learning that the envy of an unbroken body is in itself a form of hate, hating who you are, and that prejudice extends to other broken people, quote marks, heavy quote marks, in whom you can see reflections of yourself. But it also helps that each of the four major characters is dealing with their own version of this, putting forth that while it doesn't invalidate your experience or hardship, there's a commonality between people in this way. Everybody feels broken somehow. I... I am not a good partner. Well, maybe you could be. If you'd stopped to help me that night instead of running away, things could have been different. Or if you just told the truth, maybe... Why do none of you understand? I am broken. I will always be broken. Now, I know that there's something here, but for some reason, part of me is reluctant to take it any further than that. I admire that scope and that narrative umbrella, but honestly, the ending doesn't do it for me. A little too, you know, Marvel, and it's, it's like an unearned ending with this huge cast of characters with whom I feel expected to connect rather than genuinely did. And by equal measure, this story element of brokenness is either actually as it appears, effective though it is, just, just there, or it's a little too simplistic on this presented view on brokenness. Now, I'm definitely no stranger to reading really far into Ratchet stories. I did it with Ratchet 3 and Hell, probably cracked to, but there's something about the last few missions of this game that doesn't quite support these steps for me. I guess I'd have loved less simplistic language here, but the simple fact is that there actually just isn't enough game or story here, in my view, for this kind of message to be properly supported. Does the game successfully convey it? To an extent, yeah. Does it tell a functioning, competent story? Yes. Does it connect? I don't think it does, for many reasons, but the most important one is that the game is actually very short, and to have any kind of detail or specificity or even just plain avoid vagueness in regard to such a lofty idea in brokenness, I think you just straight up need more time and more story than this game is offering. If you'd like me to support that with something straight away, just take a look at the amount of footage I'm needing to reuse from this game while talking about it. I know this is a long video, but I hate reusing footage, classically, but just geez, I feel like I'm stretching everything here within an inch of its life, and that's just how tenuous the emotional message of the story in this game feels too tenuous and unsupported. More time to feel as Kit does about her insecurities, going further into the nuance of brokenness rather than a sweeping statement which feels more exaggerated and neat than I think I'm in the mood for this year. Just like I enjoy the darkness in stories to be in proportion to the hope that they present, it is better to get that balance wrong by making something that's too happy and grand than something too melancholic but the effect here is an underwhelming, non-connective story finish. 
And as I'm trying to intellectualize why this ending doesn't hit for me, especially compared to Crack, I think it's actually more obvious than it seems, because it's it's actually too focused right at the very end on what it's doing with its characters rather than what those characters have to do with the larger plot. These priorities are in different places now, switched at some point like a game of three card Monty. It was never about dimensions. And there are certain conversations that feel missing, especially I suspect to longtime fans like myself. There's a lot of skillful avoidance in the writing of specificity and detail in regard to the series history and the nature of dimensional travel, which keeps the game rolling at a really pleasant pace but it means it can at times feel like it's lacking depth. The ins and outs of timekeeping was something that Crack wasn't afraid to tackle head on, so it's noticeable that dimensional travel, a similarly heady aspect of science fiction lore for this property, is danced around a little bit. There's not even really an explanation as to why the Dimensionator is a gun now and not a hat like it used to be excluding a brief joke in a, in a Lombax orb. When the narrative tells me the universe is at risk because of the dimensions, before I even embark on my final mission, I feel reassured that the deal is sealed. The stakes have slowly fallen away to present Emperor Nefarious as the villain of the story, while the issue of dimensions is swept to the side. And the reason why all of this started is kind of irrelevant. It's basically a MacGuffin by this point. Grab the gun off the loud British man and you're all good. And for all its telling of the abuse of dimensionality, there are mechanics throughout the game that are presented as exciting elements of spectacle intertwined with dimensions, and it becomes easy to be desensitized to the depth of that concept. Dimensions? You mean the thing that helps me move across a battlefield? It's contradictory, or at least opportunistic, right? The thing that's easy for B characters to deal with unexplained off-screen? Does it make sense that the scary villain would use a dimensional portal maker to transport his sworn enemies to a prison within the same dimension? I mean, that's how the mechanics display it a lot of the time, teleport me from Xerxes to Sargasso, in the same dimension. The more I think about it, the more it annoys me that the effect of the Dimensionator itself, as presented in the game, has nothing to do with switching dimensions and is more about just warping or shortening space. The Blizzon Crystal mechanic is dimensionality. These are just teleportation portals. The last thing I want to sound like is that I'm saying this game needs to emulate Crack at every opportunity. I don't believe that. But there is something to how Crack was able to discuss and display timekeeping, a heady science fiction concept, on more than one level which conveyed it more wholly, in a more compelling way. You heard about its uses as well as seeing them, you knew its history and workings intimately, and what the risks involved in twisting it against its purpose really were. It wasn't vague, it wasn't irrelevant. I'm not saying Rift needs to do this, but in conveying and intertwining a universal concept with character storytelling, I'm just straight saying Crack does a better job of that. And no doubt there's a lot that the story has gained in terms of movement by evicting these kinds of ultra detailed conversations, but I'm still a little concerned about what we're missing here. What I mean is we're going to get conversations like this. Rivet's dimension is apparently chosen by Dr. Nefarious at the top of the game because it's a universe in which Nefarious always wins. What we can actually assume based on plot events is that it's an alternate timeline to the original series in which Clank, or Kit in this case, was manufactured by Nefarious and was manufactured correctly, and consequently never met Ratchet, or Rivet in this case. The twist of the story, I think, is that what's actually different about this dimension is that they never met, and the resistance against Nefarious was more spread out and weaker as a result. Without Ratchet and Clank teaming up, the preceding history of the galaxy is the same, but not anything after the first game. There's a little codex entry which states that Drek was turned into this sheep by Emperor Nefarious, presumably putting an end to his plans, and if Quantum slash Quark had never teamed up with Drek in the first game, or had basically been a different person to begin with, then the protopet fiasco never happens in the first place. So this means Nefarious' anti-squishy plan from the third game is successful, basically, and then he rules the galaxy. Or does it go even further back to Nefarious' plans against Quark as detailed in the third game's vid comics? Is it actually just a dimension in which he always wins and not the kit and rivet thing? Because if that's true, he wouldn't be a robot, right? Does this dimension have a great clock or Zoni? It makes sense that since Dr. Nefarious only sought the clock after his defeat, 
Emperor Nefarious wouldn't need to look for it, but the question remains, was Kit built by this dimension's Orvis? This game takes place in the equivalent to the Polaris Galaxy, not Solana where the third game was based, which would have put Nefarious on a direct collision course with an equivalent Tachyon at some point, since he was the ruler of Polaris before Ratchet and Clank ever met, meaning that history remains intact. So here's the one that really matters. If Rivet and Ratchet are alternate dimension counterparts, they're basically the same person in different places, does that mean they are each descended from a different dimension of escaping Lombax people? Because if so, they aren't looking for the same group of Lombaxes necessarily. To find Rivet's Lombaxes is not to also have found Ratchet's, since they both came from different dimensions in the first place. It's confusing, right? Rift makes a couple allusions to Caden, Ratchet's father, clarifying that he watched over the Dimensionator after the Lombaxes escaped. This doesn't hold up since he was in Ratchet's dimension, not Rivet's. There's still no canonical information concerning Ratchet's second parent, if he has one. But does that mean that Caden's equivalent to Rivet, Rivet's father, could still be out there? Since the Lombaxes built the Dimensionator to destroy the Kragmites, are there multiple Dimensionators built by countless races of Lombaxes all fleeing various Tachyons in infinite dimensions. I fully understand Rift's clever footwork around these kinds of questions in favor of a functional freaking narrative that doesn't get bogged down in the heady details. It's usually done by playing it as though, oh man, I have so many questions, but that can wait. We need to focus on nefarious. It's an intelligent deflection to buy time, but it doesn't actually promise when these questions will be answered. What's going to fix this problem is not to say that Rivet and Ratchet are dimensional counterparts. It's for Rivet's story to be similar to Ratchet's, but just be a different abandoned Lombax who got lost in another dimension. It's not too late to fix this, since them being counterparts is just their theory, not a certainty. To imply that they are dimensionally linked and somehow different versions of the same person makes this really, really messy because then that idea of equivalence extends to every piece of Lombax history, which is itself entangled with dimensions and creates full-on paradoxes. It's also possible that a lot of this information has been excluded intentionally for one reason or another, maybe to bring up in a later game and in a couple of years I'll look like a big dum-dum. But I hope we can all agree for now that the omission of the story as a storytelling choice is contradictory. I know I'm not trying to point out the gaps here because there's potential plot holes, I'm pointing it out because it's incredibly interesting and I want to see it spoken about. Neither of the counterpart pairs have conversations with each other despite there being ample time for that, and I really think it wouldn't do the game any harm to expand on these areas of character because they contribute to the world building at the same time. If there's going to be sequels, even more so. I want to see Rivet and Ratchet talk to each other more, I want to see Clank and Kit connect. I'm aware that Insomniac are the monarchs of functional writing focused on objectives, but I'd hoped for some of the subtle character moments we saw them implement in Marvel's Spider-Man, the interactions that were just about characters and their history and relationships and not there for any other reason, would make their way over here. These are really rich characters with a lot more to talk about than this story would imply. When it counts, Rift Apart missed the forest of dimensionality for the trees of what they could do with it. Because it's too easy. It feels as though it's presuming I wouldn't care about more technical, detailed conversations about how this works. But the effect of not giving me anything to really sink my teeth into conceptually is that I find it harder to let the story that's here get its teeth into me. Because you know, if I push it a little bit, it gives. There's nothing there. I do believe that this game somehow failed to convey the concept of dimensions and the enormity or details of that idea especially relevant to the series prior, with enough weight to get away with how much it wants to openly gain from it. It employs a concept and mechanics well. It shows the villain disregarding that same idea well, gains the benefits of new characters and a future trajectory through it. There's so many beautiful things spawned from this idea, this convenient, never truly dangerous idea it refuses to engage with on any difficult conceptual level. Does its ease with it betray a toothlessness? And in regard to brokenness, I find it painfully obtuse that the game's ending ties everything up in so neat a bow without a thought as to explaining how or why everything is so instantly solved. No, this fairy tale ending straight up doesn't support the message.
Nevertheless, I can accept most of it as needed to evict to keep the game moving and respect how the game is written for the most part. Again, it's extremely detailed in like the box and NPCs and stuff. It's not as if we're skint on cool character connection moments or emotional arcs, not even close. There's a distinct elegance on how the use of an alternate dimension with equivalent characters allows Insomniac to tell a familiar story, but also create something new to move forward with. Given the almost completely changed team on the 1s and 2s, I can understand the desire to make something new that this team can take ownership of. I think the way that they've gone about that is really smart, but there is one choice that I honestly think makes me a little angry. In this story about Lombax's dimensional travel and Clank trying to repair what he's broken, there aren't any mentions of Orvis or Alistair Azimuth. I don't like this. This really quite annoys me, mostly because it's pointless. And given the game's refusal to even reference Talwon, Kronk, or Zephyr at any meaningful point as well, I know that there's like a picture of Talwon in the credits, there's no discussion on Clank's origin in a Codex entry or anywhere else. It actually kind of concerns me that maybe the characters or the like the facts of what the PS3 era of the series established about the characters may have been cut from the canon. The game doesn't ever speak about Nefarious's exact history with Ratchet or Clank, so it presumes that you're aware of at least some of the history of the series, but it's not quite the same with Azimuth or Orvis because they are they are so relevant to this story. It honestly kind of rubs me the wrong way to never talk about them. This isn't just a nitpick. Rift revisits Torrin 4, the same planet where Ratchet first met Alistair, and never once says his name. By doing this, the game shows me that it had to put effort in to avoid bringing him up. Where Orvis went after Crack in time remains one of that game's biggest unsolved mysteries, and he's never so much as name dropped. There's a clear deferring of Lombax's questions to a potential next game, while Rift stokes the embers a little bit to re-engage the mystery, but it's really gotta bring the heat if that happens. And I can't see a good reason right now why Ratchet never mentions to either Rivet, Kit, or any of the monks studying Lombax architecture on Savali, oh hey yeah I actually have met a Lombax before. He was part of the reason they disappeared in the first place. He died saving the universe. He was my father's friend. He was my friend. Unless Azimuth has been cut from the canon, which would be ridiculous, why wouldn't this be in the game? It's extremely relevant. It's easy advertising for a previous game that people can go back and see, especially if there's going to be a remaster or re-release on this system. And it gives more context to the story of the Lombax disappearance for new players to understand as well. I don't see a good reason why Clank never speaks about Orvis or Sigmund when his entire motivation for repairing the Dimensionator in the first place is born directly from that storyline, from his finding his own family and wanting that same closure for Ratchet, of seeing how much Ratchet has been willing to sacrifice for Clank's happiness, to respect Clank's choices, and wanting to in some way repay and thank him for that. I really, really love where that comes from, I do, and it's not something I'd quite recognised about the Ratchet character until it was pointed out in this way. Like this self-sacrifice thing of him putting his own needs and wants behind anybody else's. And Rift does a great job of explaining where that comes from and why he's actually not gone looking for the Lombaxes already. Rashid is anxious about it, comfortable where he is and deciding to actually do something for himself rather than others brings up a whole lot of insecurities. It's a beautiful storytelling opportunity. And it enhances Clank for the same reason. Something in their friendship that Clank wanted to repay a gesture of extreme thanks to his best friend holds potential consequences for the whole multiverse. The game does a great job displaying his guilt about that regularly. It hangs over his every line, I feel, and this might be David Kay's best performance as Clank in his entire tenure as a result. He constantly sounds worried and the weight of what's happened really feels like it comes across. But this really hits home for me through both of these characters because of extraordinarily specific things about Orvis and Alistair and Sigmund that I'm aware of that aren't spoken about here. It's left unsaid when there's no reason to not say it when it tells this story in and of itself more completely. And it also misses that Ratchet could very well be avoiding looking for the Lombaxes because he's worried about overstepping the bounds of the universe like Azimuth came close to doing. And I get, you know, wanting to focus on the new characters and not confuse new players with too much information. But I also don't give a shit. I've been waiting 12 years. Unless, you know, 
they've got a whole series planned and Rivet is related to Azimuth or something and they don't want to bring him up too soon for a plot element, but it doesn't make me less angry in the meantime. And it indicates even more than a nervousness about getting the hands dirty in the lore and the details of the story here. It actually tips. The game has made active choices to avoid bringing this stuff up. It's made decisions, not just with Orvis and Alistair, to basically disregard the fact that this is an ongoing story whenever that idea is even slightly inconvenient to it, even when elements of what's come before would help it. I really like the way that this story is told, but in a lot of ways by repeating so much of where this series began, focusing on where it could be and ignoring where it's already gone, Rift Apart tells the easiest story possible. And to be fully honest, I feel kind of weird taking this stance because I've never prioritized sequelisms or fan service over functional narrative before at a base level. I've tried asking myself if this is just because of my personal investment, and I won't deny that that has a part here, but I've tried to separate the two, and I just also believe that the preceding stories of Tools, Quest, Crack, and Nexus being more present and acknowledged inside this game is still in its best interests. It would help tell what story here more effectively. The aspects of brokenness would come across if they were related to prior characters. It would help situate this already great story inside the larger universe it's currently only connected to very limply. I am trying to understand the particulars of Rift's situation as being a tech showcase, a bit of a system seller, a long-awaited sequel, and a new start with a new team. But its choice to present itself as though it's almost self-contained strikes me as kind of foolish or naive. Because even in the particulars of this current story, you just lose if you do that. The only thing you gain is an efficiency with which to tell a story that has less depth because you focused on efficiency. The larger universe is easily employed here where it supports the themes. I do say that Crack in Time is the best story of the series and presents the most enjoyable fiction with the most interesting premise to begin with. The idea of the Great Clock makes sure of that. But even so, it was my error to not have given Tools, Quest for Booty, and Up Your Arsenal in particular enough credit for setting up such an incredible launching pad from which it was able to fly. It wouldn't have been able to get that good had the series prior not set it up. It had this way of working in references and stories and characters from previous games to expand directly on them, but also amplify those games by association. It owes a lot to Tools. As much as I struggled with the experience of playing Tools, as much as I found its devices, in my particular case, emotionally hollow, the story itself wasn't something I criticized. I said it was basically so effective at adding depth to the characters that the game itself didn't rise up to that I felt uncomfortable. I felt there was an imbalance that the story side was noticeably stronger than it used to be. But of course I enjoyed the plot, I enjoyed where it was taken even more, and I'm aware throughout all of A Crack in Time that it, as I think a sequel has the opportunity to do, is enhanced in every moment by my having played and understood Tools of Destruction. I need to do that to get the most out of Crack. And Crack still offers a whole experience that's great on its own terms, but to get the most out of it, you need to have played preceding entries. That's how sequels work, it's giving the impression of one large story told in segmented bites, but while playing Rift, that simply isn't the feeling that I have. And even if Lauren, me and Sam Mags, the lead writers here on this game, didn't enjoy what Crack brought to the table and don't want to have to deal with Azimuth or the Great Clock or Orvis or anything, that doesn't matter, you have to. You're telling a story about a Lombax, Rivet, who has never met another Lombax, meeting a Lombax who has, and you've decided to misportray his response to that by omitting aspects of the story that you're purporting to tell. The economic constraints may not be as apparent in Rift Apart, but the creative constraints here are that you have an entire franchise on your back, and you are inheriting a story with things already in it. Ignoring that is to work outside your zone and to do a bad job. But this game may as well have taken place at the end of a version of Tools of Destruction in which Clank was never taken away. That's how far off base we are. That's how much I feel like we're missing. But there's still barely any actual time spent developing their relationship as I would demand of literally any story. And while watching Ratchet converse with Rivet, I kind of get the feeling as though I know both of them as well as each other when I've literally spent hundreds more hours with him and none of that time 
seems to have made much of a difference in how I see and interpret and understand their interactions. It's one thing to use familiar characters as channels to introduce new ones, but entirely another to make Ratchet and Clank themselves seem shallower to accommodate for how little Rivet and Kit are developed. They're just now all the same amount of Stranger. Nobody even acknowledges that one time Nefarious fully died and was revived by arcade multiplayer. I'm a big advocate for stories being able to stand on their own, and particularly for games to provide experiences that are whole, but this is a sequel at the same time, and that presents an opportunity, an opportunity to use more than one story that's already been told while you tell your new one, and I feel that Rift has deeply undervalued that. And it doesn't make much sense to me because there's ways to support its message as it currently is with those previous stories, explaining the time since Crack has been given more attention than Crack itself. The game makes more effort to use the Lombax orb collectibles, featuring recordings of another Lombax who knew Caden and built the dimensional map. Rift uses that remarkable opportunity to throw joke references to dead PlayStation franchises. So there's more time spent in this game speaking about Jack and Daxter or Sly Cooper than there is about Tachyon. That that doesn't seem right to me. Does Rivet even know why the Lombax has disappeared or what the Dimensionator was built to do? Would she know these things? The opening parade is a feeble and ineffective attempt to pay lip service, which basically represents all of what has mattered. And the dimensional counterparts to Quark, Rusty Pete, and Skid McMarks are also operating on a very surface level knowledge of the games and barely emotionally engaging me at all. I liked PL Affair, but he's just a new character. It doesn't matter that this is Rusty Pete. Using Skid McMarks instead of Tau One Apogee for the Phantom character is another time in a long line of games where Tau One's been completely passed over for roles that she should have had. She should have been playable in All for One instead of Nefarious. She should have been playable in Full Frontal Assault. I understand that this game on the face of things seems to slant toward nostalgia for the PlayStation 2 era, but this character is just sitting here. Please use her. Just on the fact that the Great Clock is apparently common knowledge now, I hated that in Nexus 2. It's just worth a parade balloon when it was the best kept secret in the galaxy. I don't... I don't know why this is so inconsistent. I don't have the ability to look at this game as though I don't know the series as a whole. I'm not a newcomer. But Rift Apart is sitting in this strangely vulnerable position of what I think really is a whole experience if you know nothing about the series, but somehow not if you do. It's a rollercoaster good time while I'm playing. I can forget about it, just focus on the entertaining blockbuster I'm here watching. But when I step away, I somehow can't help but interpret its masterful expansion on gameplay, but it's not caring to build on the stories in any detailed way as a wasteful stance to take. You might have noticed, but I'm making a lot of references to a potential sequel to this. And to me, it's telling that I, even after having waited all this time, don't feel sated in the slightest, and that a lot of my observations on this game are dependent on the idea that my patience may someday actually be rewarded. But even if there's a sequel, I'd be interested to see this new story continue for sure, but I have trouble believing that it would connect to that younger part of me. That the intricacy of the PlayStation 3 era would even be addressed, because Rift Apart hasn't demonstrated that it understands or even thinks that it needs that larger story. And I can't express how disappointed I would be if a game where Ratchet finally met the Lombaxes was only 10 hours long. I say this is a full length release, but this is split over two playable Lombaxes. And I'm just as sick as I ever was at this series being so goddamn inconsistent. Releasing projects that feel entirely non-substantive as part of a franchise and seeming to value itself so much less than it rightfully could. There's a peculiar kind of doubt that this game is leaving me with, questioning whether it's deliberately set up mysteries for me to follow and ask questions about based on the series prior. Or maybe I actually am just running rings around it and it's just got blinders on doing what it wants to do, whether it makes sense or not in the larger series or even abides by its own fiction. Even whether or not it understands that a sizable portion of the dedicated followers of this series paid for the last entry that mattered with pocket money, bought this one with a wage, 
and aren't only able to handle a lot more than this, but if any of them feel the same way I do, are starved of it and pissed off at how consistently this series has been falling back on nostalgia for games that it surpassed nearly as long ago. But what is the actual problem here? Brass tacks, what do we have? We have a story in which the performances and execution connect, but a fiction which doesn't, because it's risked nothing. It's excluded so much, but shot so very high on the emotional scale. And in doing so, it slips from being a game that resonates a kind, wise, and considerate energy to being schmaltzy, insincere, and saccharine in retrospect. I don't think this game on analysis does shy away from its darker, more mature, more detailed elements, but it's inherited and bloated Crack's biggest flaw. It's fucking terrified of doing anything that takes more than 14 seconds to do. It's scared to put characters inside difficult conversations. It's scared to invest time in itself, as if it's completely self-conscious of taking up too much of someone's life, even though this is a 20-year-old series right now and is allowed to take up more space than this. It's able to represent hostility and meanness and stakes, but is so glossy and non-committal in its presentation of its most weighty themes or in its embrace of its lore undertones that understanding them as being weighty and taking them seriously requires a pause and an effort and for me to explain them to people to the point where they don't believe me and think I'm being melodramatic. And maybe I'm starting to believe it too. The difference here is that Crack stopped doing that. It made choices to stand its ground at important times, to let the punches follow through and they connect with weight, not only because of the symbolism they held, but the fictional force with which they were thrown. It showed you Alistair's actual dead body. It denied Clank and Orvis's real life meeting. It killed Nefarious. He was dead. It showed you Sigmund's loneliness. It presented Ratchet's resistance to Alistair's ideals as an area for consistent tension. There were editing issues, yes, these things go by too quickly, but when it mattered the most, Crack understood that it was a story that was worth paying attention to, that it's in a universe that is worth taking seriously, and was aware of how enhanced it was by taking its damn time to lay a foundation it properly explained and knew wasn't a constantly cheery, quick place. The obvious question is, would I be willing to wait even longer for a game that has more meat on the bone, is less preoccupied with playing it safe, and is actually going to risk some emotional honesty at some point, make some characters that have more definitive, some dislikable traits, create some tension it doesn't resolve instantly, or take more than three afternoons to breeze through. Am I willing to wait for that? Well, obviously, because I'm doing it already, still. You're not giving me a choice. I just don't have any guarantees that it's ever going to arrive. I know there's a big movement for like, make your game shorter, more experiential. I don't want to be spending 80 hours in a game, but I don't think anybody who actually cares about this is asking for Ratchet and Clank to diminish its own fiction. Just take this seriously, please. I'm sick of having to do it for you. responsible for all of this. Perhaps it is because of me that the dimensions are falling apart, that Ratchet and I are lost. Oh, yeah. Well, hey, your communicator's about to get fixed, so that's something. <sighs> right. What I do know is that this is a story told in a game with a lot to already do. And if there's one thing I can't accuse Rift Apart of being, it's lacking in clear vision. For now, this Broken Things message is here, enhancing what surrounds and motivating other aspects of the movement. I'm sure there's a lot of depth here that I'll come to see further down the line. I'm very willing to be flexible on this. Story messages are very sort of fluid things. But there's so many moving pieces in this game. I've spent so long talking about them and this story perhaps just being well presented and exciting and fluid is what I'm just, I'll acquiesce. This is a compelling character story which is presented nigh perfectly within a game which also plays nigh perfectly. It's explosive, 
Oddly emotional sometimes, contains a message of some sort, it's full of heart and is oh so perfectly in tune with the gameplay and the worlds in which it takes place. It's just not conceptually quite in tune with itself. Hey, I'm sorry for what I said before. You're my friend and thank you for coming back. Team? Team. If or when the next Ratchet game arrives, I hope the team that built this one remains, because it's obviously a fantastic game. For folks who've played every entry in the series, a lot of this will be as pleasantly familiar as parts of it will be fresh and new. It's of a reassuringly high quality, which was, I think, important to me at least. I think it's understandable this one time, given the context of how long it's been since the last really solid Ratchet game, that reaffirming those fundamentals was the most important thing to do. And it links up with what I was saying about the series at the end of my long retrospective and throughout it all as well. The series had a design foresight of about two decades. It's basically future-proof, it doesn't get old. Rift Apart has carried on that legacy, the legacy of embracing new technology, different gadgets and puzzle mechanics worked into each game, often new vehicles, different stories and planets to visit, and of course, a different juiced up arsenal each time. It's such a mutable formula. In combining it with the right movement and level design appropriate to each other in this game, has reconfirmed this as being as solid game franchise design as Sony have ever had. It has a brand and points about it that are attractive on the surface, action elements and whiz-bang shooting, but also a complex core of opportunities to extend its life across multiple games, obviously. But also any type of environment and many kinds of stories and atmospheres, some of which Rift Apart has broached for the very first time, others it showcases more fully than we've ever seen before. Rift Apart refines Ratchet & Clank by its renewed focus on characters, its full-on embrace of PlayStation 5 technology, and its injection of brand new movement into its combat and platforming. I loved playing this game and consider it one of the strongest singular entries to this franchise. Rift Apart is at the very least an absolute technical marvel, visually nigh on flawless, but most importantly, is an entry which can and does showcase and represent often the best aspects of what Ratchet & Clank has offered throughout its long but slightly distant history, and beefs them up to the here and now. It will, hopefully, catch attention and bring the series into new players' hands, find its footing again, and regain critical attention for its potential and mastery with power and immediacy. From my perspective, to channel that familiarity into new areas in the future, if there's truly even any need, would come by addressing the fundamentals and changing what seems unquestionable that hasn't been touched yet, even just to see if it works. Less reliance on sequential levels, a different health system, a new villain and a greater focus on stealth, perhaps in the series which has centrally involved a pair of travelling companions, giving them a home. I don't know. What I do know, is that this formula for Ratchet is familiar and fresh in all the right ways because that's how it was initially designed. And I trust this new team to do something even more incredible if there's a next time. And I really, really hope there is because I haven't allowed myself to be excited or even hopeful that there'd be a future for Ratchet and Clank at all in a very, very long time. And on that personal note, as a content creator, as someone who likes to ruminate on games and the contexts which surrounded their creation, I fully understand Rift's desire to appeal to new audiences and new players. And I loved seeing how it's beginning the series anew. As a lifelong fan of the series, I'm delighted to see it include touches that I've been asking for for a long time. But as someone who didn't allow themselves to get excited, and as someone who's been waiting so long for this story, I was relieved to see the heart, but I'm frustrated at its lack of substance. In some ways, I think the refinement on the story end has gone way too far and sanded down edges so smoothly that it's missing things now that I didn't even know that I appreciated. I'm disappointed to see it take this great new tone and these great new characters in the unapologetic direction of blockbuster breakneck entertainment and sacrifice clarity, 
fictional depth, connectivity to the characters of previous games, to apparently preserve pacing at every opportunity. It feels like it's made exclusively for the people who don't want a game that's too long. They don't have the time, they just want the experience, they want the game to be done. Clearly, I've got all the time in the world, and Insomniac taking all the time in the world to finally make a real follow-up which in itself takes no time at all, is bewildering and sour. This is the sequel to A Crack in Time that 12 years told me I would never get to play, and that's really big for me and a lot of other people. And I find it difficult to articulate how I could have loved this game but also feel so deeply disappointed. This doesn't make me happy to do. I don't like having to bring up Crack so often. I just hope you can understand what I'm trying to say by doing that. Because instead of having something in Rift Apart to work off or dissect, I'm trying to discuss this game's lack. The lack of detail in its own story, the lack of depth in its own characters. And it's a hard thing to feel justified about, like what a game isn't while still enjoying what it is. Because I do, I hope that's come across. What this game is, is good, but in a rare case, I think what it isn't actually still undermines it all the same. I've always taken the stance of trying to learn creative lessons from Ratchet & Clank games in my videos, reflect on what they taught me growing up about how to make cool art. This time it's different, it's not me looking back on a game, it's me assessing something new here and now. But just for some consistency, one more time. What I've learned creatively, what I've been reassured of creatively by Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart is that if you want to make something that genuinely connects, that lasts longer than itself, you have to grow some teeth because otherwise you will get bit. I do not want for meek art. I do not thirst for easy sentiment. I don't know why anybody would. So creatively go further into yourself than you think you should. Be more detailed and more extreme and more honest and bigger and bolder and more deadly and harder to understand than you expect anybody to be able to grasp. Then and only then have you made something that someone will connect with. The most personal, is the most universal, and the most widely appealing is, by the same measure, often as shallow. Do you want to get a little ways with everybody, to be dropped before you get to say anything at all, or do you want who holds you to never let you go? A song, a video, a show, a movie, a game is only ever too long or too much if you misconstrue playing it to be the point. Grow some teeth, Insomniac, or keep getting bit.